Are we all set? Not yet. Just two more seconds. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Katie's taking control tonight. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. I've got a message that says is now streaming live on YouTube. You're good. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's 631 on November 4, 2020. Um, meeting of the South Road Board of Selectmen. Uh, all members of the Board of Selectmen are present. So call the meeting to order. And um, first order of business is to read Governor Baker's uh, intro. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order. Imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the South Road Board of Selectmen will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the Town of South Road's website at www.southroadtown.com. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch or participate in the meeting may do so in the following manner by finding the meeting at www.southrotown.com slash remote meetings. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so despite best efforts, we will post on South Road's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. So again, we're called to order. And the first item is uh, public comment. Uh, and we do have some attendees. Do we have anybody? I don't see any hands up for public comment. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our scheduled appointments. Um, and I see Ms. Varner is with us. Uh, the first item is a uh, volunteer interview, uh, Angela Varner for the Municipal Technology Committee for term ending June 30, 2022. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ms. Varner. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. And uh, thank you for um, volunteering. Um, uh, you seem to have a pretty good background um, in this area. And um, Mr. Probst has, has um, given you an enthusiastic uh, endorsement uh, to participate on the committee. Uh, do you want to give just a, a real thumbnail sketch? We've got your volunteer form, but a real thumbnail sketch of uh, just a little bit about your background and why you're interested in doing this. Sure, sure. Um, well, I've been in the technology field for over 20 years now. Um, I think I've done almost every role in technology, everything from running local support through uh, managing infrastructure, wide area network, data centers, um, and then moving into more of the application development side. Um, I've worked at uh, quite large firms as well as um, smaller consulting companies. Um, and my focus now is building a hybrid um, based cloud architecture knowledge management system for my current employer. Um, so I have been I have been doing it for a long time. I've also lived in Southboro for about 15 years. I have a daughter in the local high school. Um, so I was interested in the technology committee really as a mechanism of giving back to the committee, um, giving back to the town and uh, seeing the town improve. Great. Let me ask you, I mean, we're, all, we're always looking for um, um, people to volunteer and talking about ways for outreach. Um, did you um, um, research and look uh, for a possible volunteer um, opportunity or did someone on behalf of the town reach out to you? I'm just curious. Uh, Matt did reach out to me. He did. Okay. Yes. He had, he had a good idea of your background and, and uh, I think he saw me on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I figured you'd be a pretty good fit and it sounds like you would be. <laughs> All right. I'm going to, um, there's, there's in addition to myself, there's uh, four members of the additional members of the board and I'm going to go around, see if they have any uh, greetings and, and questions for you. Uh, Ms. Braccio. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
Welcome, Ms. Varner. I, uh, I just want to thank you for stepping forward. I think your qualifications are, are wonderful. I think Matt made a great choice and um, I have no questions. I just look forward to supporting your appointment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Malinowski. Hi, Ms. Varner. Thank you for putting in for the MTC. Um, I do have one question. What would you be most interested in contributing on this committee? Um, the thing that was most compelling to me was the uh, five-year strategy work that's being conducted. Um, it really resonated with me to hear more from citizens and develop a more data-driven approach to how we form the, the strategy for the town. Um, so that was the part that I was really interested in. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now to Mr. Shea. Hey, Angela, how are you? Hey, Brian, I'm good. How are you? Good. So I don't have any questions. I've known Ms. Varner uh, <laughs> for the better part of the 15 years that she's been in town. Her daughter is the same age as my youngest, and they're, our paths have crossed in many ways over the years and uh, through many activities and events. And I think uh, she's going to be a tremendous addition. And thank you for stepping forward and, and volunteering at this time, you know, as, especially as your daughter is in the high school years and, and, and fading out. It's good to see that you're showing the interest in the community and wanting to give back. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Mr. Stivers. Thanks. Um, again, thank you, Ms. Barner, for volunteering. Uh, you, you've got great credentials. Um, as, as a 15 year resident of Southborough, uh, I'm sure you've observed many things about how town government works or doesn't work. Uh, are there any items on your agenda for things that need uh, near-term focus? I think the strategy work is great, very appropriate, but any things that you see where we might be able to uh, make improvements as far as how we deliver services via technology to our citizens? I guess what I'm, what I'm starting to learn is, you know, like I think many towns, um, technology investment is usually somewhat moderate in, in scope of, of the other expenses. So you end up with more siloed based approaches to technology as opposed to having a more integrated type of system across the town. And there's probably some quite low hanging fruit that could be addressed that would you know, increase cost efficiencies, um, increase the capabilities for citizens to interact with different groups in a more seamless fashion. Um, I don't have my head wrapped around our full technology inventory yet, um, but I do think there's, there's probably some opportunities there that would be worth exploring as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're being very polite about us being underfunded, <laughs> woefully underfunded <laughs> technology and silos abound. So I think there's an opportunity for many steps forward in this and uh, I look forward to your contribution to this going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Varner, back to me. Uh, thank you for, for volunteering. Thank you for uh, making yourself uh, available tonight. Um, I think you'll enjoy um, serving on a town committee. And, and, and again, your skill set seems to fit pretty well with this particular um, town committee. Um, we're not going to hold you any longer tonight, um, but is, is there a motion? I'll move to appoint Angela Varner to the Municipal Technology Committee, a term expiring June 30th, was it 2022? Correct. Right, second. Seconded by Mr. Shea, discussion? None, all in favor, Ms. Braccio? Aye. Ms. Malinowski? Mr. Shea? Aye. Mr. Stivers? Aye. And Mr. Healy is aye. Um, Ms. Varner, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, enjoy your time on, the, on, on your new committee assignment. Thank you all very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. All right, let's see where we are. Mr. Chairman, it appears that um, the um, um, the chair of the Board of Health, health uh, agent, and the public health nurse are all here. So, all right. So um, we were uh, designated for 7 p.m. I think we're going to be able to start a little bit um, earlier. And so, Ms. Amico, Mr. Pazinski are going to be brought over. And who'd you say the third person was, uh, Mark? Uh, Mary Lou Woodford, the chair of the Board of Health. Okay, and Ms. Woodford. All right, do we have, we have everyone. All right, terrific. Um, hello everyone, um, uh, Marty Healy, I'm the chair of the Board of Selectmen. Um, appreciate um, your being able to be with us tonight. 
um, hopefully for a discussion that's, that's helpful for us in um, our responsibilities um, and, and how they touch on uh, and intersect with yours. Um, but also as a, as a informational for uh, members of the, uh, uh, the community. And so let me, um, after the welcome, let me um, give you an idea of what, at, at, at a basic level, um, but obviously you can add on to it. And I suspect maybe other members of our board will add on to it. Um, but we'd like to hear a, a, um, some background from you about where from a um, Board of Health perspective, you think the town of Southboro is right now, um, particularly in light of Governor Baker's new uh, orders um, and mandates that were issued uh, at the end of last week. Um, and as part of that, whether there are things that uh, additional things you would like to see from the Board of uh, Selectmen that would uh, uh, potentially help you do your job and uh, help the town generally deal with, you know, what we've been going through for eight months now. And, 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 you know, unfortunately there's, there's, there's no at least bright light at the end of the tunnel yet. Um, so with that, I don't know, um, uh, Ms. Woodford, do you want to start out as chair of the board and, and uh, we can get going on the discussion? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Cause I don't have, I don't see if I have a mute or a on here. Uh, we can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting us to, um, to your meeting and, and giving you an update. Um, we all know with, uh, with what we've all been dealing with in the last year, it's, um, it's really put a shining light on public health in our community, what we have, what we don't have, where our, where our gaps are, where our challenges are, and uh, we've, we've been in discussion about that. Um, we wanted to talk about a couple things tonight with you. One particularly is giving you an update on COVID, what's going on with COVID. Um, also to give you an update on the Davis Farm uh, dump site, which all of you are probably well aware of. Um, Paul's gonna give you an update on that. And Emily's gonna give you an update on COVID. I did want to just sort of start a preliminary discussion about uh, the gaps and uh, identified challenges that the Board of Health has in order to provide comprehensive public health services to Southboro going forward. And we are in the process and we'll be coming back to you uh, with more information, but we are in the process of reassessing what we have are we able to provide the 10 essential public health services um, that are required? Um, we're not certified. Is that a direction that we want to go in? Um, but we do know that we need a stronger structure um, in order to provide those services. And so to be continued, but I just wanted to sort of put that on your radar. We're, we're in the process of doing an analysis. Uh, the state government hired a committee um, which generated a report. As all of you probably know, Massachusetts is unique from the entire country um, in how we do public health. Uh, 351 cities and towns are all responsible to conduct their own public health activities. Some cities and towns have, you know, really broad gaps in what's provided. I think in Southboro, we've been doing the best we can with what we have, but we're reliant on the budget that we have and the budget that the, you know, the town provides. And so we're going to come back to you with more information. We're going to come back to you with what we think the staffing structure should look like, what a new budget should look like and, um, and, and more to come on that, but just sort of to, to give you that information. And, and let me just interrupt for one quick second. Ms. Wood, sure. Woodford. And um, I, and I suspect maybe uh, certainly most, maybe all of the other members of the board, um, have seen um, um, the discussions you've had. Um, it's one of the nice things about the, uh, one of the few nice things about the Zoom world we live in now that they, we've got pretty easy access to um, uh, uh, board and committee meetings. And um, so we're, we're quite aware of the, the discussions you've been having and, and uh, look forward to that dialogue continuing down the line. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll start because COVID's front and center and 
really been impacting a lot of the work that we've been doing. Emily um, is going to give you uh, an overview of, of what COVID has presented to us from a health department um, and, and what really is going on um, in Southboro specifically. Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me because I can't see either. <laughs> my volume is uh, loud and clear, Ms. Amico. All right, great. Um, well, nice to meet you all. I'm, I can see you, but I don't know if you can see me. So it's sort of weird. <laughs> um, so I came on board uh, mid-March, just as COVID was um, hitting the fan, I guess you would say. <laughs> and um, so I've started out primarily just doing um, work with COVID as the public health nurse. Uh, at this point in time, probably about 70% of my time is COVID based. I am able to get most of the things I expected to get done in the fall done, um, which includes flu clinics and um, other types of planning. Um, but with COVID, I thought I would just break it down percentage wise, what we're doing um, as a department and how, you know, how we spend our time dealing with COVID. So as a public health nurse, uh, we, as public health nurses, we do um, case investigation and contact tracing, which have become buzzwords, I think, even in the news. Uh, we educate and manage isolation and quarantine which again are now buzzwords in the news, but public health nurses have been doing isolation and quarantine on all kinds of, of diseases, uh, infectious diseases for many, many years. Uh, I spend probably about 75% of my COVID time on um, case investigation, contact tracing, and managing isolation quarantine of the residents. Uh, so I've gotten to know a lot of residents and I've enjoyed most of those interactions. Um, then another 10% of our time is spent um, with phone calls with the state being on their um, twice weekly webinars for DPH and the command center, uh, getting updates on COVID, what's happening, how to deal with certain situations. And then also education calls regarding the state surveillance system, which is um, an electronic uh, software that we use to do disease surveillance that was around before COVID. And it, we investi investigated over 90 different diseases, um, but now it is 90% COVID. Um, we also look into um, Tick-borne illnesses, food-borne illnesses were primarily what we did before, but now it's um, the COVID investigations through the MAVEN system. So about 10% of the time is, is used getting updates um, every week uh, on that system and how to best document and how to best approach certain situations. Uh, another 10% of our time is working with area schools on protocols and how to handle, again, specific COVID situations. Uh, uh, with anything in nursing and medical field, it's, every individual brings their own um, challenges and strengths. So each situation is unique in how um, we approach things. There, there's a clear definition for things, but then how that definition you know, works within a family or within an individual situation is is different. So um, I've worked closely with the administration at NEC, Fay, St. Mark's, as well as Northboro, Southboro District. And I work with a great medical advisory committee um, with the Northboro, Southboro District. And I believe um, Dr. Medina is going to speak tonight as well. And He's an excellent resource and, and wonderful to work with. Um, he's also a resident of Southboro, as you know. And then the last 5% of my work is 
consulting and advising the town, uh, area businesses and organizations on COVID related issues, um, how to deal with when someone is positive, how we prevent COVID, um, all sorts of different situations. But I thought that kind of gave a good picture of, of what we've been doing. We fortunately have a low number of cases. I know that we've been in and out of the red, so to say, the last um, month. And that is due to our small population size. Um, I think because according to the calculations, we only have need to have 11 cases to go into the red in a two week period. So if you have a few households that have multiple cases, it, it ticks you right over. So um, I'm happy to address any questions at any time. I, I try to emphasize that with the residents and the business owners and, and the town employees that I, I wanna be a resource and I wanna, I wanna help people through this. I, I, I feel fortunate to be in the know and um, have been able to educate myself in order to help educate our community. So I think that wraps up what I wanted to say, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. Okay, um, Ms. Amico, Ms. Woodford, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is go around um, with Ms. Amico and um, uh, have dialogue with any members of the board. Um, and I'm just gonna ask a couple of things before I'm gonna start off with Ms. Braccio again. Um, Ms. Amico, uh, thanks first of all for your, your statements about the, the classification, the red. Um, um, I mean, any, I, I think anybody who sees the red gets concerned but by the same token, the the um, the numbers did seem quite small for us to get into that category. Um, so I, uh, you know, appreciate your comments about that. Um, I mean, this is an opportunity. This is a you know, um, um, in addition to the the one on one or or broader consulting you do with folks in the town, um, this is an opportunity in a, in a public forum. Are, are is there? Um, uh, advice, general advice you would give to, to us, to the, to the, um, to the members of the community about things we're doing well, um, in, in terms of, of addressing the, 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 the COVID pandemic and things that we could think about improving on? Um, well, improvement wise, I think mask wearing, and I, <laughs> I think that's across the state, and that's why the um, governor put out the order this week on Monday at his press conference, announced that on Friday it is going to ma be mandatory to wear your mask anywhere in public. Um, we found that mask wearing is the number one risk reducer, and we've, we're also seeing that in schools. Um, because in schools, everyone is wearing a mask all the time and there's little to no transmission in schools um, it, and no transmission in our schools as we, we've seen as of yet. So that's a great thing. Um, so I think when, when people are following the rules um, that have been set forth, distancing and wearing masks, we're doing a fantastic job. So, um, Okay, great. See, and now, what else can I say? <laughs> okay, no, 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 that's fine. No, that's that's that 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 is that is uh, helpful. Um, knowing what the right direction is, and that and that you know, in, in large part, you're you're going, um, you're heading in the right direction is good to hear. So I'm going to go to to um, Ms. Braccio next. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi, Emily. How are Hi, you? Lisa. Thank, thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, just a, a comment and a couple questions. So I. I on behalf of the board, I mean, we, we just want to thank you so much. I know how overwhelming COVID must be. Uh, you, you came on at a, uh, a very difficult time, you know, you really didn't have a, a good transition into Southboro, so to speak. Um, I don't know if, if you could um, share this information or kind of give us an idea. I mean, you've said that um, through contact tracing that the schools at this point don't seem to be... Um, 
a transmission point for COVID. So, I mean, is there something that you could suggest? I mean, does it seem to be from, from work, from stores, uh, just basically in anything you found, is it still small gatherings? I mean, is there some way or something we could do that all of us could be better um, based on what you're seeing and through the contact tracing? Um, well, again, I go back to our small sample size <laughs> because yeah. we're a small town and, and I've, only been dealing with 90 or so cases. Um, it It's really hard to say, like we don't have any clusters per se. People are, it, you know, it's out there. It's in all kinds of different places. So it, Emily, it's hard I don't, to say. Um, you, you can go ahead, Mary, Mary Lou. I, I bet you have a larger sample size to go well, from. <laughs> I just, I don't, people probably don't know this, but I've been doing COVID investigations in Framingham as in my day job. And, and some weeks it's 80, 90 hours, you know, it's just, it, Framingham is a much different situation than we are in Southboro. And I feel really fortunate at any one time I have 60, 70 cases at a time. And there's 15 of us doing this investigation in Framingham. Um, we're seeing outbreaks in sports teams. We're seeing outbreaks in, there's a lot of long-term care and group homes, uh, a lot of large businesses, um, you know, Targets, Walmarts, Whole Foods, all of those kinds of things. So I think we're fortunate in Southboro that um, we are smaller. We don't have a lot of those high transmission sort of areas. Um, and a lot of people are working from home, which makes it uh, really helpful. Um, but kids are now getting back into some of the sports and activities and, and that's been challenging. Um, it, kids aren't, uh, that are getting um, COVID, they're doing really well, um, but you still have the isolation and the quarantine and um, it, it still is a big impact to the family. Um, and, and so I think we just uh, having myself doing that work and Emily doing this work, Emily and, I, Emily and I can communicate with each other about different things that are happening and how to manage different uh, cases, which has been helpful. Um, but in Southboro, I, I think that we're, we're doing really well. And the mask wearing is, is definitely now known as one of the biggest risks uh, mitigators that we can do. The other thing I wanted to let people know in the public forum is what is an exposure? What, what, is, what does it mean when I get exposed to someone that I might not know has it, that is um, either, either asymptomatic, so they can transmit the disease to me, or um, they're slightly ill and don't really take it seriously and they're out and about. So an exposure over since really pretty much from the beginning has been you're within six feet of someone with or without a mask for 15 or more minutes. And that's when we do contact tracing and we do investigations, those are some of the things we ask people is that, you know, would you have any idea where you might have been exposed and um, and they, you know, share places they've been people they've been around and that's sort of goes to the contact tracing. Well, that, that um, exposure definition changed about six weeks ago. Um, and part of that was uh, related to studies that have been done. And it shows that if you're within six feet with or without a mask for 15 minutes over the period of a 24 hour period, that's an exposure. So that's really different for people working in office settings, right? So say you go up the elevator with somebody and then you don't see them the day and then you go down the elevator with them for lunch and then you come up. I mean, you add those times together and that's potentially an exposure. So just something for people to think about um, as they think about where I might've been exposed to this. and. In the contract tracing and investigations I do, about 60% of the people know where they contracted it, know where they were exposed, and about 40% um, really have no idea. Right. Thank you. That was actually very helpful. I uh, that was great. Thank you. And and Emily, one final question for you is, 
Well, the kids aren't in school every day and the schools do have uh, nurses. Are you able to utilize um, any of the um, school nurses to help you do some of the contact tracing or anything that you have on your plate to make things a little easier for you? Um, so the school nurses have students every day of the week now. Um, the school nurses were very helpful in the spring during the surge, uh, but uh, other otherwise, um, I I haven't been able to utilize any nurse hours with with the with the school nurses. But I I must say I do work closely with. Mary, Mary Ellen Duggan, who's the school nurse lead or the wellness coordinator for the district. And um, she's an amazing resource. And we have a, a great mutual relationship now at this point. We, we talk multiple times a day. And when we go a couple of days without talking, we, we are like, hi, what, what's going on? Like, I'm happy I didn't talk to you, but <laughs> um, so you know, it's been a really strong relationship with the school and and been very helpful with cases or contacts that are in school. Like um, we can communicate really well, so. Great, thank you, that's it for me, thank you. Uh, Ms. Malinowski. Thank you, Emily, for um, presenting to us tonight. Um, I do have a question um, and it kind of relates to what Lisa was asking. Um, but the schools are looking to do some more regular testing. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the tiered approach, depending on how much funding is available. Um, but what will that, if the, if the school nurses are not available to do contact tracing, um, then what I assume we'll have more positives if we're doing more regular testing. Um, what do you envision that to look like? And how much will that impact your caseload? Um, well, first, I just want to correct one thing. They do do the contact tracing in school. So anything that's happening within the school building. Okay. Done by the school nurses. Okay. Um, or, or Mary Ellen. Um, but with the testing, so they, they have piloted some testing with the staff already. Um, there's been two, um, testing periods. And I probably Dr. Medina can speak better to this, but um, but the um, but I think it was just one day where they set up the testing in each office during a certain time period, and you know they they worked through that that way. Um, I I wouldn't be able to address it in a, in a good way, so <laughs> I'd have to bring Mary Ellen on here and and ask her that specifically. Um, okay, I just didn't know if that was gonna impact what you're adding to what you're currently doing. Um, so I haven't been part of the testing uh, piece, but if there's a positive case and there's contacts identified, then both myself and if it's at, if it's at Algonquin, then it would be myself and the Northboro Health Department that would, um, follow those, those individuals. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Mr. Shea. Thank you all for, uh, for joining tonight. And really the questions I had have been touched upon by Marty and Lisa already. And you know, certainly understand and respect the confidentiality aspect of, of all the cases, but you know, it is good to hear uh, the guidance that uh, that all should be following to, you know, that masks are, masks are key to this. And hopefully we can continue to spread the message uh, to everybody on that. And Mary Lou, I look forward to working cooperatively on uh, the upcoming budget. You know, quite a long time ago, I was on a committee that actually goes back to college and there was an advisor that was on who, when it came to budget season for that committee we had, gave us the line that, a budget is a plan of action expressed in dollars. And I think that we're gonna have a much different plan of action uh, moving forward with the Board of Health that I think that uh, this pandemic has brought that to light. So look forward to working cooperatively with you as we uh, 
best staff and best prepare the Board of Health for the town. Thank you. That's Thank you. Great. All right. And finally, Mr. Stivers. Thank you. Uh, and Emily, Mary Lou, thanks very much for these updates. Very helpful and great to get uh, word out to the broader community uh, uh, through people who may watch this, this meeting. Um, a couple of questions, Emily. One is, uh, is it your sense at this point that we have sufficient resources to do the contact tracing that we need to do? Are we missing any contact tracing simply because you don't have enough hours in the day or the week to actually get to everybody that you need to follow up with? Um. We definitely need more nurse hours, um, especially when there's an identified contact in, in the school system. Um, as it is right now, uh, grades pre-K through five, um, it's, it's policy to um, quarantine the entire classroom. So all the individuals in the classroom, including any teacher contacts, are all identified as close contacts. So that can be as many as 15 individuals, uh, maybe more. Um, so it is quite a workload when that happens um, because you want to notify people right away. And with, with the school, again, it's, they've developed a good system in getting that out, but it's also happening um, with with residents who attend other schools um, outside of town and in town um, because then they have many contacts. Um, there's sports contacts, um, work contacts. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, 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 it does get overwhelming. And um, Emily, today, I, 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 I just, I, 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 yeah, I just thought I, I clarifies I, I yeah. some of you probably already know this some might not so with the investigation and the contact tracing it's all based on where the person lives where their address is and so if someone in town goes to school in another town um then and they are identified as a positive case exposed in that school in another town it's Southboro that does the investigation and the contact tracing because they live in Southboro. In the same respect, if we have a business in town and we have five employees that work there and four of those employees live in other towns, we could have a cluster or an outbreak in that, in that business. And sometimes it takes a while to figure that out because if those four other people live in four different towns, until you get into the tracing and find out that it was actually a business in Southboro that that came from. So mm -hmm. it, it creates challenges. And when people go to get tested, they go on their own. And, so, and most of the testing sites, especially if it's a drive up site, they use their driver's license and people don't always update their driver's license. So they hold their driver's license up to the window. They take that information. They don't quite get that. And then the, the result goes to that town. And then you find out they're not there. They actually live in Southboro. So there's a lot of intricacies. Uh, I feel like half the time or more is more detective work than it's really nursing work um, because it's hard to get down to that information. But when it's in a school, one of the Northboro, Southboro schools, it's especially the elementary and it's a classroom, all of those kids live in town. So it's all of those phone calls would fall on Emily, mm -hmm. as opposed to the high school. And if you had a classroom or something in the high school, maybe half of them live in Northboro and half of them live in Southboro. So it wouldn't be as onerous of a responsibility. But I just want to clarify that piece that sort of helps you kind of understand the work that goes into doing the investigations and the tracing. Right, thank you. And Emily, just to clarify one of your earlier comments, I thought you'd said that uh, if, the, if there's an outbreak in school that the school nurses do the contact tracing, is that not correct? They do, but then we, we follow up on isolation and quarantine. Uh, okay. So, um, um, we follow them, we enter them into the MAVEN system. Um, a lot of the time is spent documenting. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as anything with nursing or medical field, a lot of time is spent documenting. And, um, uh, what, one, of, one of the other things that Mary Lou was just addressing is, is the communication among 
different um, boards of health or health departments. And it is a lot of detective work, but it's also a lot of trying to get a hold of other people so that they can follow their residents, whether it's, um, you know, a coworker of some, a resident of Southboro or a classmate or a teammate. Um, and you're passing off a, a contact that's in their town, you know, it's, it's communicating to them, but we are learning new ways of tasking <laughs> these, these events to other towns. So, um, Good. That, that's it's, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just to actually follow up on a point that Mr. Shea raised in terms of budget, uh, it's my understanding, Emily, that uh, when you started this arrangement, you were supposed to be part time. Is that correct? Uh, yes, my job description had fifteen hours. Yeah, so part time is now one hundred and sixty-two hours a week, or something like that. <laughs> But not quite that much, but yeah. In, in terms <laughs> of, of resources and fairness, I'm not sure that we can wait for the FY22 budget or 21, 22 budget, I guess, to uh, um, uh, start thinking about um, fair compensation for time that you're putting in on this. So if we need more nursing hours or to get you paid fairly for what you're doing, I think that's something we ought to think about addressing. Uh, I, I, no, I'm getting paid. I don't want to make it sound like I'm not getting paid, but um, but we just we need more more hours. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I can't I can't work fifty and sixty hours a week, yeah. so it's um, whether it's you or other other nurses. Yeah. It seems to me we are at the point of, of again needing resources. Everything I read about. Uh, managing COVID is reinforces the value of contact tracing and follow-up and so forth. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. And, and we do have a part-time nurse that started about um, five weeks ago and she's, she's been great. Um, yeah. But again, I think we need the flexibility to have, to have more, more nurses and more nurse hours. So. And I think Sam, so one of the challenge challenges has been that um, Emily although she doesn't want to do this for this amount of hours for the period of time she's been working, but we've had the benefit of having the CARES Act funds. And the CARES Act funds is funds that come to the city and town for specifically for COVID um, related activities. So Emily's been able to be paid. However, those funds run out at the end of December. And we've been told clearly that um, there's not going to be a, uh, you know, we thought there would be more, maybe an extension of that act or something, but at this point they're saying no. So for us um, in Southboro, we need to think about, so what happens after January 1? And we don't foresee that we're gonna have this control to a degree that Emily could go back to 15 hours a week at that point. So then what? And so to your point, and, Emily's feeling like she needs help now, but she's working full time. And so, you know, what's going to happen after January 1? And those are real concerns. And those are things that we really need to think about. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, I guess, was the point I was trying to make. Thank you, Mary. That's much more eloquently put. Uh, seems to me <laughs> we need to get ahead of that. This is a critical function for us, and we need to figure out how to stay on top of it as opposed to playing catch up there. Uh, one final quick question, Emily. I'm not aware, are there drive up, drive through testing um, locations in Southboro or are there plans to do some of that? Um, so the state has a program called Stop the Spread and there's information on mass.gov. And I believe it's, you just, I, usually what I do is I just search Stop the Spread and there are multiple sites in our area. There's three sites in Marlboro and at least two sites in Framingham that are free to all Massachusetts residents, whether you're symptomatic, no symptoms, or just wanna be tested. Um, I, I refer many people to those. They, they do take your insurance card in hopes that they can be reimbursed for something, but if insurance doesn't cover it, or you don't have insurance, it's covered by the state. Um, and that that testing program has been um, extended through January 15th is my understanding. No so, locations in Southboro though at this point? Um, there, um, I believe Reliant Medical has it for their patients. And I don't know if there's other, other um, physicians no, offices that offer it, but okay. um, I have many, um, 
residents that have utilized that that site. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks for the great effort. And uh, hopefully we can find ways to provide the right support to keep ahead of this. Thank you. Thank right, you. Thanks, Sam. Um, Ms. Amico, uh, Mr. Brzezinski, I'm going to you in a second. And then after <laughs> that, Dr. Medina. Um, but just one, first a comment. Um, and just listening to you, there's, there's one very obvious thing that, that, that we need to do. And that is, um, you know, the election's over and we know that, that uh, you know, um, Ms. Clark is our representative in Washington again. Um, our state rep and state senator have been elected again. Uh, I'm a little bit more hopeful now that, well, the election's almost over. Yeah. <laughs> at, some, <laughs> at some point in the next month, it's going to be over. Um, that, that in fact, the, um, uh, the Congress uh, particularly revisits the issue about funding for uh, um, COVID-related expenses, that it's, it's 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 crazy if that's not a um, an immediate priority. So that's just a comment, um, and we can do our part in in terms of of dealing with our um, state and and federal representatives. Um, the second thing is, and I know HIPAA and confidentiality and the like, it would just it might be helpful if there is data about the amount of um, contact tracing that that you are doing. I mean, you broke down the amount of your time that's that's being given to the various. Uh, you know, components of your job, but um, data about the amount, you know, uh, whether it's on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, just the level of contact tracing that is being done. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that maybe that is not um, HIPAA or other confidentiality protected. And that's something we could get our hands on. Um, uh, it, it would just, again, data is helpful for determining where we need resources and, and how quickly we need resources and the like, so. Yeah, I, we're actually able to run reports from the MAVEN system um, with different variables and, and contacts is one of them. Um, one of the issues is that I can only run it for people with Southborough <laughs> addresses and there's often contacts that come through town that um, are out of town, <laughs> so. Um, well, I, what I'm going to do again, is all different situations. But. What I'm going to do, Ms. Amico, then I'm going to have uh, Mr. Purple or Ms. Hale follow up um, with you. I, I would like to see whatever sort of um, um, data uh, in that area is available, but also maybe some of the other areas that that are an indication of exactly the volume of 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 work that's necessary at the local level to address this thing. I'm guessing that other members of the board would also like to see that sort of information. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Well, I'm that'd not be surprised to see it. tracking, you know, 500 people or 200 people or whatever. Exactly. exactly. It, it might be, yeah, it might be helpful to even in an email or if you can summarize, like, what are the kinds of things that you think would be helpful? What are the data points, you know, that you think would be helpful? The amount of time it takes to trace a specific case, the number of actual people that we're tracing. Like, I know what we know what we do, but what would be helpful for you? So if you can maybe just put some bullet points down as to what you'd like to see and and we'll obviously share whatever we can that's um with that's that, that, that's that's terrific what we will do is in the next few days mr purple we will deluge with with um, um items that we would like to have included in that email and then you can put together an aggregate and and send it along to uh, uh ms woodford uh and uh and our ms amico so that's great thank, thank you for for uh, uh for making that available appreciate it Mr. Chairman, can I just ask one other question, just sure. to follow? Yep. Um, so when we talk about contract contact tracing, Emily, can you explain what the qualifications are for that position, and does it need to be a nurse? Um, so yes, well, con yes and no. So I, I believe it, it does need a nurse and Mary Lou can probably speak to this too. Um, but to contact Trace, you need to be able to make the phone calls and be able to um, educate people on what quarantine is, um, what they need to do during quarantine and also be able to um, advise them on testing and monitoring for symptoms. Um, so I can speak to that a little bit because mm -hmm. in, in Framingham, they're all nurses. Um, and Framingham's been unique and has been really shown to be a model for doing some of this work. 
Other towns have used non-nursing um, staff to do the contact tracing. And the res what has resulted is that some of the information it hasn't been complete or hasn't been fully uh, explained to people and it's caused more time and more work um, in the end when a medical person, a nurse has to follow up. So when you, when you call somebody to do the contact tracing, it's not, it's some of it's symptom discussion. Um, some of it, it, which really a nurse would need to discuss. Sometimes the, um, the person you're talking to discloses things that are unique to them. Um, it may be asking more, are you able to stay home? Do you have enough food to stay home? for the two weeks and not go out to the store. And if they don't, how are you gonna get them food? And so case management comes into play here and trying to find resources, getting a way to get them food if, they, um, uh, if they're sick and they need uh, oxygen or they need something else. It's just, it's more involved than when you're telling someone you need to stay in your house and if you're all alone and you don't have anyone else, it's all of those other nursing um, case management questions that you can't really teach someone who hasn't had that education. Mm -hmm. Someone can contact Trace and get the basic information and then, but then they relay it, well, this person I'm not sure about, and then someone else has got a call. And, and so it, it hasn't proven to be as effective to have non-nursing um, or someone in that medical field do that work. Okay, thank you. Mary Lou, can I add also there that I think it's a HIPAA issue. Uh, if you've got someone talking about uh, personal health information, protected health information, a clinician such as a nurse actually has access to that under HIPAA and uh, is obligated to protect the privacy of that information where uh, an administrative person, for example, who's not a clinician, uh, isn't uh, by nature of their job obligated to protect that privacy unless you have other agreements signed with those people. So it's a lot more complicated. You no, know, absolutely. That's a great point. And that's, you know, nurses just know that that's you're educated about that. The ethics about what you can talk about, the privacy and confidentiality, all of those things are part of the training um, that a nursing personnel has. And um, yeah, and, and those are concerns if you have a non-nursing person making those calls. You're right. Absolutely. We don't want to get hit with a HIPAA violation for hiring somebody who doesn't have the right protection there. So, All right. Um, Ms. Miko, Ms. Woodford, thank you very much. I assume at least maybe one or both of you are going to stick around while we talk to uh, Mr. Bozinski and Dr. Medina. But Mr. Bozinski, I'm going to go to you now and you're going to update us on the uh, Davis site, correct? I don't know if you can hear me, Paul, but I can't hear you in case you might be talking. Still can't hear you, Paul. Uh, Might have been. Uh, is, I don't know. He doesn't show as being muted, but... Uh... No, it flashed up a little bit that it was muted. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what to do. Um, all right, uh, Vanessa, Ms. Hale has a very good idea. I'm going to go to Dr. Medina and, and Paul, if you can hear me, um, Ms. Hale is going to be reaching out to you and see if we can address this uh, offline while um, we're having a conversation with Dr. Medina. So Dr. Medina, hopefully hopefully your microphone works well and uh, uh, so. welcome. Oh, yes, thank you, perfect. Thank you. Is um, there a way I can share a screen? I'd like to, uh, I have a, a, couple, a PowerPoint actually to go over some stuff. Oh, that would be great. Um, where are our Katie Tech could allow him to share screen. Yeah. Katie, if you could just make um, Dr. Medina a, a co-host, he could then share his screen. All right, we now have a visual on you, Dr. Medina. That's step one. Or at least you're outlined. <laughs> Shadow. <laughs> and we're taking steps to do exactly what you described. Hopefully it'll just take a couple of minutes. 
And you're muted, by the way. There we go. I just wanted to echo all of you and my thanks to um, Emily and Mary Lou for all the work that they're doing. I, I can firsthand attest to all the hard work that Emily does um, in working with the school alone and how much of that time that takes for her. So, so. Um, do we know, uh, Vanessa or Katie, if do we have um, um, screen capability? Yep, we just need to make him a co host in just a second. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to give us a quick description, uh, Doctor, of what it is we're going to be looking at? Maybe save sure, a little bit sure, of time on that. Absolutely. So, what I'd like to talk about is look at some real time data about our, our school. And as well as, I'm going to actually be able to pull it up now. Um, all right. Let me uh, share my screen here. Um, I get the right screen here to share. Um, I think I have to, huh, sorry about that. Just That's to okay. Get I, 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 during the day, I deal with WebEx. At night, I mostly deal with Zoom. And uh, it's, a, it's a strange new world we've had to get used to these last few months. So I, Yeah, for some reason, my slideshow isn't coming up to share. All right. Can you all see it now? No. No? All right. Sorry about that. Let me just try to see why this isn't. Because uh, I've got it on my screen here. Um, if it doesn't work, I'll quickly go through the slides. I apologize for this. Um, let me see. All right, if I do this. Oh, something happened. Oh, you know what? That's okay, I'll get back on. Ah. All right, am I back on now? Your screen's on. The yeah, screen, screen is on. on now. Perfect. All right. So let me uh, go to present mode here and get started. So, um, so basically, all of you know who I am. My day job is working for UMass, and I'm also our district physician for North Point Southboro, and of course, most importantly, a resident of our town and a parent in the district. Um, so, as we move on, I think our two goals that are most important are: we need to keep our community rates low. And we need to keep our children in school. Uh, that's sort of a, those are two universal goals that we all want to achieve. Um, so an overview of the numbers, um, Emily has gone through some of this already. Um, our state as of today has a 1.9% positivity rate. So of all the tests done in the past 14 days, the weighted daily average is 1.9% of those tests were positive. I think the concern we all share is back in September, this number was 0.8% and it's been steadily increasing. And I think that the big number that we're watching now is our hospitalizations are increasing as well. And many hospitals are now reporting COVID positive patients again. In our town, as of October 29th, we did have an average daily rate of 10.3 cases per 100,000, which put us back in the red zone. We've had 15 cases in the past 14 days. Our percent positivity right now in our town is at 0.9%. Um, our school district dashboard, so as of October 31st, we had four active cases in all the schools. This includes faculty and staff. And again, for, for privacy purposes, um, whether it's a, a faculty member or a student is protected. But what I'd like to show on this graph is that, you know, obviously there are a significant number of students and staff that might be in quarantine. But if you look at the orange bars at both at the high school in the South Broad District, a, a, a fair number were quarantined because they were, there was a close contact in their household, um, or in some cases, maybe even another activity that was outside of school. There are quarantine cases in school. Now you'll notice that the, that green bar in South Bro is almost up to 15. That's because as Emily mentioned, when you're in an elementary school, although the kids are six feet apart and masked, 
because they are spending the entire day together. They're younger kids. It is very possible that they did get within six feet of each other. And so the safest thing is to quarantine the entire classroom. So that's why you see that number so high and you do not see as, a, as high for the high school because in the high school, um, they are all six feet apart. They change classrooms. So really the time that they spend is much more limited and it is a little easier to contact trace with the high school students to know exactly who they might've been a cumulative 15 minutes, um, you know, uh, closer than six feet to within for 15 minutes over 48 hours. Um, but the most important thing is that there is no evidence of in school transmission. Um, all the close contacts of anyone in the school that tested positive have been tested and confirmed negative. Uh, so that is the most important piece of data. I think that's the take home data here. And these positive cases in isolation. These were contact traced to have acquired outside of school. I believe there may be one or two where it is unknown exactly where they may have contracted it, but it was not within the school building. So um, just a very quick overview. I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but this is just some data from Europe that shows how uh, safe schools really are with proper mitigation. Um, uh, Germany, Denmark, Norway, you know, even when their community transmission was low, return of students to school did not increase transmission in the community. Um, Ireland did a great contact tracing study. Uh, three children ages 10 to 15 attended uh, one primary and two secondary schools with 905 close contacts. They tested only contacts to develop symptoms, but none of the contacts tested positive, and they had continued sports, music, and choir practice and did not have any of the degree of mitigation that we do in our school, because this was back in the spring before we knew enough about how to mitigate uh, this virus better. The United Kingdom, this was done in the summertime, 30 schools, and in those 30 schools, when they looked at cases, they only found two cases of student-to-student -student spread. Australia. They looked at 15 schools, had 18 index cases, 765 close contacts identified, and only two positive cases. In Australia during this time, uh, they, well, they allowed anyone that desired to go to school to go to school. So it, essentially it was full in person, but of note, a number of people did choose to keep their children home. So that's just a brief summary of why we feel so comfortable in keeping our schools open based on this, this good factual data uh, from Europe. In Australia. Uh, let me go to my next slide. So the other thing that we have seen now is a new public health crisis in our children and I wanted to make the board aware of this about rising mental illness and suicidal ideation in our students, particularly those in middle and high school. This has been documented in some studies and I'd be happy to share these links um, for you if, if you would like. Um, it's being reported by primary care and mental health clinicians in our communities. Our local ERs are now seeing increased numbers of youth with suicidal ideation and suicide attempts due to the pandemic and due to less time in in-person learning. Um, as an example, UMass Medical Center, their, their pediatric ward is now primarily filled with um, youth with mental health emergencies and not medical emergencies. Um, and the ERs have um, children waiting for days for psychiatric placement, they are so full. Um, substance use has increased uh, with nicotine and alcohol and marijuana both being all being used, um, increasing by adolescents, again published in studies, uh, rise in obesity in all ages, a lot of kids need school for physical activity, again not a huge surprise, um, increased parental alcohol use is now being reported as parents are coping with the stress of the pandemic and, and stress of, of trying to teach kids remotely even if it's a few days a week. And I think what concerns us a lot is, is potentially some unnoticed child neglect and abuse that is obviously first noticed by our schools. So taking that piece of information and then looking at how we can best serve our community to mitigate, um, I really like this Venn diagram from the CDC because I think it outlines beautifully what safe activities are and what the unsafe activities are. So obviously when you look at what they call the hotspot there, no masks, crowded, indoor an automatic you know, COVID spreader versus masks outdoor and keeping six feet in between. Um, when you look at schools, they are on our Venn diagram right there. Obviously the kids are indoors, but again, they're wearing masks and maintaining distance. Um, a lot of outdoor activities again are safe, but when you get into this area, that's those, these are the kinds of activities that we as a community need to work on to make sure that they are not happening. So, um, moving to the next slide. Ah, sorry. 
There we go. So indoor dining is one of the highest risk activities that there is. Um, in a CDC study in September 2020, adults who tested positive for COVID-19 were about twice as likely to have reported that they dined at a restaurant in the past 14 days prior to their diagnosis versus individuals who tested negative. And I think that's important because I imagine, you know, and Emily, um, Emily and Mary Lou can actually um, attest to this that contact tracing when someone's been in a restaurant must be a huge challenge. And of course, we have to remember their masks are off in a restaurant. And often people are going to restaurants, you know, there may be a limit for a small group, but they're probably they could be going with people that are not in their household and sitting at a table unmasked for a long period of time. Uh, a big problem, as you can see, looking back would be sports that are held indoors where players uh, may be unmasked. And we all heard that Massachusetts hockey rinks were closed for two weeks. I believe they're due to reopen um, in two days again after 14 day closure. But there were 30 clusters of COVID-19 cases associated with ice hockey activities, um, 60 towns across the state. Um, and 108 confirmed cases. And I can tell you my own clinical practice. I have dealt with hockey players that have tested positive for COVID-19 as well as um, kids playing basketball. Unfortunately, although right now um, recreational basketball is not allowed in Massachusetts, people are going to New Hampshire to play basketball. So um, this education has to get out there that this is a, this is a high risk activity. Um, so how can we achieve our goal? So obviously the most important thing is wearing masks that you've already heard. Um, and with the governor's mandate in all public places, I think this will help. This will help things that we have observed in town that have concerned a lot of our town's residents and that's parking lots of schools, um, whether it's students at the school, whether it's parents, a lot of times it's baseball games that happen in the summertime where in parking lots, there were large groups of people unmasked. Um, spectators at some of our, our games on our town fields are often very close together and unmasked. Um, basketball and tennis courts where large groups of people not in the same household are not wearing masks. Um, I, the transfer station, I, I think, you know, the signs are up there, but I do see a lot of residents at the transfer station again now wearing masks. Again, there's not that degree of contact that's there, obviously, and you are outside, but again, any mitigation that we can do will prevent transmission of cases. Um, so in terms of achieving our goals, I think, you know, how do we look at this as a community and look at indoor dining? We don't have a lot of indoor dining venues in our town and obviously people can go anywhere to, to um, you know, enjoy a meal when they want to in surrounding towns, but what can we do within our restaurants um, to, to make an indoor dining um, environment restrictive? Um, and then we do not have a lot of indoor recreational facilities or gyms, but again, knowing that these are very high risk places where COVID-19 can spread to, into our community, that, would, that is one thing that we need to probably look at more carefully as well. You know, in terms of our supporting our Board of Health, I think you've heard a good case presented by the people doing the work on the ground um, about contact tracing. But the other um, thing that I hear from residents a lot is, 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 a, is difficulty obtaining a COVID test. I mean, there are um, stop the spread sites that Emily did mention that exist um, in Marlboro and in Framingham. Um, you know, the people who are patient of Reliant can get a test at Reliant, but they are getting backed up and have a, you know, ha can have a long turnaround time for the result. Uh, people who are UMass Memorial patients can actually get a test done in Worcester or in Marlboro at the, the hospital campuses. Um, right now, their turnaround time is, is fairly decent within 24 to 48 hours, but they too are getting overwhelmed. Um, the Worcester site tested almost 600 patients yesterday you know, serving a large community, they were able to get the results out in less than 48 hours, but it, it obviously does require a lot of work and we are doing a lot more testing. So some towns have looked at the idea of doing testing within the town. Um, there are different vendors out there that can do it. Obviously the school, as you know, is, is embarking on um, screening testing for faculty and staff with funding through vendors, but those vendors have also mentioned some towns looking into ideas of offering testing for town residents who need it, whether it's symptomatic town residents, whether it's um, people who've been contacts or people who just like to know they were positive. I think it also helps us with a lot of people who travel. The, the state has a travel quarantine for 14 days. The school is following that to the letter. So if a student um, has traveled outside of the state, 
outside of one of the safe states, they do need to quarantine for 14 days, but it is often nice to have a test as well to know what their test status is once they've traveled. Um, and the other part of it that I talked about was our mental health crisis. And I think we are really struggling with this. Um, it was already a crisis before the pandemic in terms of obtaining timely treatment for our children and our adults. Um, and, you know, Salisbury Youth and Family Services is, an, is another organization that I will put in a plug for because they also need to meet our community's growing needs due to the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly our youth. And that is all I have. Um, so I can stop the screen sharing right now and um, open to any questions or anything about that data. I did go through it pretty quickly, but I wanted to make sure I got everything in to leave time for questions. All right, well. uh, Dr. Medina, uh, uh, Marty Healy, I'm the chair. Um, thank you very much. The one thing I'm going to say is I would, if it's possible, if you could um, send what you just um, went through um, to Mr. Purple, the town administrator, and he can distribute it. It's got, I, uh, I'd like to take a look at some of those links. I mean, it's, it's can be depressing, but it's also, um, uh, I think important information for us to have. Um, and with that, I'm going to start with, with Ms. Um, Malinowski. Um, if for no other reason, then I think, she, I, I don't think it's close. I think she is the member of the board with the most children who are directly impacted by, uh, by the school issues you've been touched upon. So uh, Chelsea, go ahead. Great, thank you, Dr. Medina, um, for your presentation. Um, can you um, kind of give what the rest of the school year will look like from a health perspective? So we're not seeing transmission in schools. Things, I think your team has done a phenomenal job of contact tracing, keeping parents informed um, with the emails that are going out from the office. Um, but can you kind of elaborate Elaborate if we're kind of gonna stay this course or what the plan would be um, going into the winter? That's a great question. I mean, obviously the goal is to maintain what we have for sure, which is the hybrid learning model. I think that that, you know, at this time, you know, any revert back would be quite detrimental to our children as you uh, um, can all see. And that is going to involve this whole community commitment that we talk about in order, in order to keep our children in school. Um, you know, it would be, you know, one of our goals would be to try to increase in-person learning as much as we can for our children when we feel, if, you know, if we can continue the course and, you know, that would probably be look like beginning with the elementary school students. Um, they are likely the ones that are most suffering educationally from hybrid learning um, and whether that looks as a K through two model first to see if that if that subset can can go back to school full time and you know move up as go and that's where you know the screening um, testing that's being looked at by the district will be key in terms of like yet another mitigation factor along with masks social distancing you know uh, symptom checking the end contact tracing when needed, that, that factor alone will help us identify cases even sooner before they become symptomatic and, and quarantine them to prevent transmission within the school. You know, one of the other thoughts, when we look at the K through five population, we are already quarantining the entire classroom because we don't know about the distance that those children can maintain. So having a full classroom, you know, would, would in, in one way not affect things all that much because that whole classroom will be quarantined again anyways. And in some ways may, may disrupt their learning even less because the entire classroom will go with their entire teacher remote if there was a case in that classroom. You know, right now a teacher, if half the classroom is quarantined because their cohort had a positive case, the teacher's responsible for two different cohorts doing two different types of learning, which makes it very difficult. Um, and again, looking the middle of high school will have to be a discussion as time goes on, I think. So when a classroom is quarantined, it's just that cohort for where the contact was. It's not both co cohorts. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. It's just the cohort. Um, so cohort A, the, the 10 or 12 children in cohort A of that second grade class would be, okay. would be quarantined. Okay. In the middle and high school, because the kids are six feet apart at all times, even when they're eating lunch, even though their masks are off, technically, no one is a close contact per se at the high school. But again, that's where I think when Emily can attest to the amount of contact tracing it takes to make sure a high school student has really been six feet apart. Um, and, it, and it also goes to show that in, in, in the middle and high school setting, keeping kids in school is so important because 
they're going to get it outside of school when they get together, not in mm-hmm. school. And, and the more we can keep them in school and organized, the less likely they are to gather outside of school. Right. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your efforts. And I appreciate the schools being open personally. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I have two teachers and I do feel the same way. I feel the exact same way. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thank Kelsey. You. Mr. Shea. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. That's great information there. And similar to the comment Marty had, I'd love to see that uh, on our town website as well, just to um, on mm-hmm. the COVID page, just to, you know, a lot of the school parents and families may see this on a more regular basis, but for everybody in town to see it, I think would be important as well. So thank you very much for putting that together. Uh, Mr. Stivers. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Medina. Very helpful information. I think most of my questions have been touched on. Uh, kudos to all who are doing the great work to try to keep ahead of this and uh, let's stay in touch. As if issues come up, I'm interested to hear again from Board of Health or Dr. Medina about things we can do to be supportive here. Thank you. And Ms. Braschio. Good evening, Dr. Medina. Thank you so much for being here. And, and thank you so much for being the voice of our children for being so proactive and being so available and vocal within the community about the importance of keeping the kids in school. Um, You know, uh, I I think you touched on it with the mental health, but even even thinking about our our young children, um, you know, when they're not in school, all of the social pieces they're missing that help them, um, you know, further along in life. So I know you have been an amazing advocate and, and I thank you for coming tonight. I thank you for the presentation and please don't stop. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all for, I mean, not every town gives us all the opportunity to share all this. So I thank you all very much. All right, Dr. Medina, um, we'll let you get back to your evening um, uh, or you can stick around and, and uh, uh, listen to Mr. Pazinski uh, who's up next. But again, a terrific presentation. And um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that my kids are out of school Um, except for my oldest daughter, who's now back in graduate school. And I will tell you that her graduate school is is not as good as you've just described uh, um, the the public schools of Northborough and Southborough are in terms of of grappling with these issues. Um, So kudos to you and and the entire team. Yeah, we we have a good team. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Mr. Pazinski, are you there? Yes, I am. Can, Can you hear me now? Yes, Paul. Welcome. Good. It's, I can't see you, so I won't say nice to see you again. But uh, yeah, we go back a ways. So uh, you're yes. going to tell us about the Davis site, correct? I'm sorry, what, Marty? You're, you are going to talk to us about the Davis site, is that correct? Did the I not? Business, the, I'm sorry, what? what? <laughs> Why don't you tell us what you're going to tell? What you're going oh, okay. To- well, I was, what, I, what, what I was going to try to say is uh, to keep you... Uh, updated on on just a couple of things that have popped into our laps. One is, of course, the Davis Farm dump off of Breakneck Hill Road. Um, The other is just to let Sam know that we haven't forgotten about the uh, haulers permitting licensing procedure, which we will be instituting soon with the board. But um, uh, this is obviously a very challenging time Uh, for all of us uh, and everybody has a very sensitive heightened anxiety and stress and so forth and we are trying to make the people who come before the board whether they be builders um, real estate people attorneys or whatever their job is is tough enough and so we want to make it easy uh, being whether they are residents or not Uh, we've been unfortunately hit with a a multitude of things besides just the COVID. Uh, There's been a a slight building boom or sales of homes. And I just counted today, 18 Title V inspections that just came in. And we're getting about 15 to 18 every two weeks. And many of the homes are selling the minute or the week they're put on the market. And so they don't have an inspection for their septic system until after it's been put on and after the sale, then they find out that the system has failed. So of course, there's a lot of uh, anxiety and can we get soil testing and our 
sanitary inspector is out straight until almost December. So I've been pitching in because I'm a certified soil evaluator as is he. But anyway, that's not what I wanted to talk about tonight. I just wanted to make you aware that the, the, the dump that's on town land, which the Conservation Commission spearheaded to buy, that's on the Davis property. Uh, that was looked into 15 years ago, myself and Phil Mulk and Janice Conlin and a few other officials back then. Uh, the Conservation Commission hired several people, an attorney uh, to see if there was any litigation issues and also a licensed site professional LSP to do investigations to see if there was any contamination of the site. In essence, they could find no contamination, no environmental contamination. Um, however, they only took surface leachate. They did not dig down 10 or 3 feet. We have also analyzed the private wells in the neighborhood and found no contamination of the wells at all. So we're satisfied about that. Um, we don't know what might happen in the future, 50 years from now, uh, with leachate that could leak. We don't really have an idea of what's way down under the ground. But talking with the DEP officials, they said that they have a lot of these town farm dumps of various sizes. And this was never permitted by the Board of Health. In other words, we never gave what is called a site assignment because it was built at a time when there was not even a, there was not even a DEQE, not a DEP. Uh, there was no requirements. You could just put stuff in the back of your farm, your back of your barn. And we come across quite often small debris of barrels and harrows and broken down tractors and so forth when we're doing soil testing that is partially buried on a lot of sites. But this has an extensive amount. And um, so my quick analysis and report to the Board of Health, which I will be giving Monday, but I can give it to you too, uh, is a quick recommendation uh, that what I would suggest the town think about doing, starting with you, the Board of Selectmen, is to appoint a, an oversight committee, which is what we did with the Parkerville landfill closure. This does not have to be a closure, by the way. This can be just a picking out some of the debris, taking it off site, and then just covering it over according to the DEP officials and according to their master plan for closure. So what I would recommend is that we get a committee formed with maybe somebody appointed by the Board of Selectmen, DPW, Board of Health, Conservation Commission, obviously, because it's on their property, and maybe one or two other interested citizens. And that, um, we would immediately look into getting the property surveyed because there's two or three pieces, parcels adjoining the, the town owned property that the Mr. Davis, the farmer dumped debris on their land. They've been very amenable to having it taken off. They're not, they're not, they're not anxious to uh, cause any problems at all. And, and um, they've been very cooperative according to Aldo who's talked to them, but that, the survey was, would probably be an immediate need, and that's probably about fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars for doing a survey of all the property, and then also outlining where the actual dump is. It probably consists of anywhere from three to four or five acres. Uh, it's kind of hard. It's a very irregular shape. The other thing, I, the second step I would recommend is getting the uh, the jungle, the trees in briar in brush and so forth removed so you can see what you're doing. And then the last step would be to hire, put out a bid and get a RFPs with a company that would take the, the trash out, uh, at least the first couple of feet. And um, a lot of it is metal, some cans is glass, there's broken, broken furniture, broken farm pieces of various kinds. And then uh, clearing that off the site and then just leveling it and putting back some decent soil in um, some sort of uh, like red rescue or rye or whatever, whatever what is satisfied, satisfactory to the conservation commission. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So, Paul, you, uh, this is Marty. Your, your yeah. expectation is that you are going to make a presentation to the Board of Health um, right. about the, the subjects you just covered um, and that a formal recommendation from the Board of Health will ensue? That's what I would hope to have happen, Marty, is that after my brief report to them, they would make a recommendation to look into uh, having you appoint a committee, an oversight committee, which is what we did on the Parkerville Road landfill closure. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's, that sounds like a reasonable approach. Um, and uh, you said that y your expectation is that that meeting is going to be on, on Monday. So presumably yes. you'd hear directly from them um, shortly after that. And I'm happy to hear, Marty, that you do listen into the Board of Health meetings, you and others. That's which is good. That helps out. Well, if if I was ever going to listen in on Board of Health meetings, <laughs> these last few months have been the time. So, um, uh, Paul, do you mind if I um, um, open up to see if members of the of our board have um, some additional follow up in this area? Be delighted to entertain any. Questions. Right. Brian, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Shea. Thanks. So, Paul, you had mentioned that there was an LSP involved in this process of the past. I mean, as I understand, there's an LSP that has looked at it more recently as well. I believe the Conservation Commission is talking about uh, maybe hiring another LSP to do some digger, di deep, deeper digs, but I don't know anything about, I don't know any, any I don't know any of the particulars about that. The right. only, I, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, you go ahead, Paul. The only, I have, I have in the file uh, a host of documents, which I was gonna to make to the Board of Health as, as attachments to my little brief report. And these attachments would be the information that was in our file, with the exception of material that's marked confidential, attorney privilege only, because Aldo has told me, and although I don't, he, he hasn't marked up other than there are, there are documents in the file that's marked confidential. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm allowed to make that uh, available, but I, there's other documentation and there is LSP reports of various kinds that were done in the past. Well, I guess in general, Marty, I guess my approach to this would be to get, make sure that we have an LSP on board who is leading this effort and really follow guidance of the LSP as well. I think that would be a key, um, key step, you know, to, to set a, a a path set a uh, uh, really a path that the town ought to follow in addressing the situation, cleaning it up, and cleaning it up in you know the most environmentally responsible way. So you know I think I personally think it's worth getting um, you know that professional level involvement on board and you know set a roadmap for us to follow to get this taken care of. Would you and the board members want to take a look at the previous LSP documents that we have in the file to see if then you feel that there should be additional more research uh, done by a current LSP? Yeah, I think certainly looking at what's been done to date uh, is is a good is a good step, and but you know we ought to have. A, so somebody on board now that we're, that is guiding us through this process. I would fully concur with that because I, I'm not an expert on hazardous materials. What I've identified in my brief report to the board is that it's, it's a public safety problem. I could find no evidence of it, it being an environmental or toxic problem based on the previous LSPs, examinations, and reports. But it's definitely because of the broken glass, uh, metal parts, 
when I and Melissa walked the site recently, it's there are parts that are very squishy, uh, meaning in other words, there's some kind of debris underfoot uh, with leaves and everything on top, but like you could fall through. Yeah, I, I, I think Paul, I'll, this is Marty again. I'll just jump in and, and echo what Brian said. I mean, I, I would, I would um, very much either, either as part of a package with whatever we get from the, the, the border health after the meeting on Monday. But I'd like to see what, what the, 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 what building blocks there are for work that's already been done in this area. Okay. Very good, Mr. Chairman. Just if, if I can add one, uh, one piece to what Mr. Shea was saying. Uh, the town did have an LSP um, on board for, for many years. It was the same person. Paul can probably remember the name better than I can. Um, and um, he had come out and, and done the testing that Paul had described, did not find any contamination in the surface leachate, tested the nearby wells, did not find any contamination. Um, the test that was done recently was done to determine if any of the um, farm um, um, waste uh, was uh, sitting on any part of an aquifer, um, which would then cause, uh, you know, additional issues. And I think some of the mapping showed that there may be some underground, um, uh, some underground water that may be in the vicinity of where the dump site is, which may or may not have an impact on, on what needs to be done on the site. Uh, I know that Melissa Danza had been looking at um, new LSPs because the current LSP has decided um, it's uh, time to retire. So he's no longer available to us um, and was seeking proposals from, um, from, uh, from a new LSP to see who we may want to use. And you know, I would take suggestions you know, um, from Ms. Danza as well as Mr. Pazinski as to who we may want to move forward with here. They probably know you know, a whole lot more about that than I would. Yes, okay. That's Mark, helpful. that previous LSP, Dennis D. Amor, PhD, yes. D. Yeah. D. Yeah. Lesson site professional. Uh, we have all his documents and um, we could definitely make all of those available to you. Yeah, one of the things, Paul, I can tell you about this board is um, we like paper. We like data. So the more of it you're able to make available to us, the better. Very good. Are you all set, Brian? Uh, Mr. Stivers. I'll reinforce that we like red lines too, in addition to paper. So yeah, don't send any don't send any word documents to Mr. Stivers though, Paul. Yeah, I can even red line a PDF. So I've developed enhanced skills. Um, Reinforce what Mr. Shea said. Uh, sounds like we actually have a plan for going forward. I think it's important that we actually follow up on this and uh, get an LSP and uh, the mitigation plan out there so we can articulate it to people and get this resolved because it's dragged on for a long time. So I fully support that. Uh, I can't resist one of Mr. Pazinski's comments. Um, if we are actually serious about following up on the trash hauler licensing piece that we heard from Mr. Butler in terms of his recommendations relative to the transfer station issue, I think the, the timing is tight on this in that uh, we have good model to follow and that Westboro has adapted the state guidelines for the licensing process. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel for that. The thing I'm very sensitive to is that as we've heard tonight and I've heard in ongoing meetings from the Board of Health, they don't have a lot of extra capacity at this point. So I feel great concern about loading additional work on the Board of Health at this point. And I'm wondering if there is some other resource in uh, town government that we can uh, co-opt for a while at least to help get this off the ground so the Board of Health doesn't have to take on extra tasks from an administrative standpoint. Uh, I don't know, but I think that might be an interesting one to consider. Otherwise, uh, we may miss the window here for 2021 to get the licensing started, which is maybe not fatal, but it would be great to get going if we're actually serious about doing that. So I throw mm -hmm. that out for consideration, not discussion tonight. Perspective. That's it for me. Thanks. All right, Ms. Braccio. Thank you. Um, I, I also agree with, with, with Mr. Shea and uh, the path moving forward. But Paul, can I just ask you, um, as far as public access around this area now, I mean, we've talked about um, the, the ground being squishy, debris underneath and, and barrels being visible and whatnot. What, what type of public safety hazard, 
uh, and, and potential liability now that we're discussing it, do we have? And should this area potentially be roped off in some way um, just for the safety of the public to keep them away? I was thinking of something of that sort, uh, but again, I don't know where the bounds are. And I know we are, Davis has trespassed on other people's land. That's why I thought the first thing would be to get a survey done with markers, uh, stakes or whatever to, to find out whose property is where, but then to mark off or tape off. Uh, I would like to have that done in concert with the conservation. It's really their land, yeah. but you're right. It, it, it's kind of hard to find. Uh, you just can't go from Breakneck Hill Road and, and find it. Uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to locate. It's, it's, it's like I say, a jungle. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Malinowski. Thank you. Um, hi, Mr. Pazinski. Um, can you explain the timing and where the funding would come from the 15K and then the subsequent um, money for the remediation? I have no idea where the money would come from. <laughs> so are you looking, uh, with, are you looking with to- Budgets being what they are, I have no idea. There's definitely, uh, there's no CARES Act money. Uh, there's no FEMA money. Uh, so so I I, guess it, I have to, it would have to be, it, I, 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 in my report, I indicate that it, it's the legislative body that would have to decide whether they want to appropriate any funds. So are you looking to spend the 15,000 in this fiscal year? I'm not looking to spend any money. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I know that budget is very tight and it's not my, not my wish to spend any money. It's really up to you and the town meeting people if they want to spend money. It's my recommendation that the first thing that should be done is the survey. The second thing is that is the brush and tree clearing just so you can see what's what. But where that money is going to come from, uh, I have that's that was luckily that was not asked as one of my charges, if you will. OK, so let me ask it this way. When are you looking to have the survey done? ASAP, okay. meaning in other words, within the next few months. OK, and then are you looking to bring an or are you looking to have someone, maybe not you, bring an article to town meeting to fund? the remediation like is is that what you're looking to have a remediation plan that would go into effect next year and we would have to bring an article to fund it to town meeting that is correct so it'd be have to be the spring town meeting and okay. this is where i would hope that a committee would be formed so it's just not just the board of health okay. it would be what we did on the parkerville landfill uh because of, you're talking multi-million dollars this is not that big a project uh it's not like the parkerville road landfill that was a cover with a particular type of membrane and all different layers of uh, soil and engineered and so forth. This, this is more just a clearing the junk out of there and um, making the properly uh, presentable, if you will, uh, walkable so that there is not any liability or safety problem, which is what I perceive. Okay. But that would have to be done at the town meeting. Okay, thank you. And hopefully the article would be sponsored by the committee. Okay, Paul, thanks very much. Is that um, the extent of what you wanted to cover? It is. Okay, terrific. Um, well, I think we are um, gonna let Ms. Amico, Ms. Woodford, who I still are, see are still on, and Mr. Pazinski go for the evening. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, just many thanks for making yourselves available. Um, uh, we've already thanked uh, Dr. Medina who's left us um and uh uh incredibly helpful information and and sounds like you're going to be in touch and and we'll be in touch correct thank you very much you have a good night all right take care thank you all right um next on our agenda is ms galligan i did not see her no she just arrived oh she did okay so let's let her join the party Hi, Karen. You are muted. Now you are not. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we have been 
um, talking with you and talking among ourselves about having shovel ready projects and um, you have brought us some proposals. So why don't I turn it over to you and, and you can tell us what, what you've got for us to consider and what actions you would like us to take. Okay. Um, I kind of think the memo is probably the easiest way to start with this. Um, so in order just to get Quarter Hill Road more up to speed and have it most ready for shovel ready, um, I, we need to get, um, I just need to have some more of the chapter 90 allocated to it um, to finish the design and bring us through the full construction phase. So it should be the last request for, um, for design work. And um, we've been funding that through chapter 90 right now for, um, since the inception, originally we were thinking of making Porterville Road a TIP project that, um, isn't probably the best choice of, of ones for that um, once we had been through the main street. So we're going to, um, I kind of take gone away from that idea, especially um, the standards have changed for the DOT. That's the main reason why um, Cordville is just not wide enough. So we just wanted to um, be able to go and put down, and I forget what the actual, um, an additional 145,000 out of chapter 90 money towards the Cordville project. So I just would like um, permission to allocate that. And if you guys can then grant Mark commission to sign uh, permission to sign it, then that would allocate that money. And we, we'd work on that this fall. And then when we bid the project, um, it, would, it would also work through the construction phase and the bid phase. Um, okay. uh, yeah. Is that it for that project? Because what I think I'll do is is talk about each of the items um, individually rather than looping back to them. Okay. Okay. Um, it it is um, it is pretty much it for that project. I mean, we are looking to be able to use complete streets for that um, if we can get complete streets in time. I haven't received back the um, we got the contract for it. I haven't received the contract. We signed it. We sent it to DOT. I haven't received an ex fully executed one yet. Once we get that, we can work on our project list. And once we have that, then we can ask for money for a project. That's for complete streets. Yes. Okay. So we're hoping to be able to, I think that will come through in time to fund this. Okay. I'm going to ask two very, hopefully quick questions. And then Mr. Stivers, I'm going to go to you. The you said the fall. So if if this is approved, this would be that hundred and forty five thousand dollars would be spent in the the autumn of twenty twenty, doing work. Um, no, it would actually carry through for a, a while. Um, that it, it we would we would feed off it through the entire project um, because it's it's only covering the engineering. So they're going to do the design, the bid, and the um, and the construction oversight. So okay. as long as that construction is going on, that they'll be feeding off of this. So probably just be, in terms you know, of w w when would the work? When, in other words, assuming assuming authorization from the board um, for that amount of money, when would the work start? Even though I understand it would go would on for a while. This winter. It would. Yeah, we okay. Would start using it this winter, um, but it would continue through until the project was over. Okay. Um, so it's not a situation where where the 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 items that f that fall under the one forty hundred and forty five thousand dollar umbrella, when they're they're completed, then there's a next step. In other words, these would bleed through an awful lot of work throughout the entire project. Is that accurate? Okay. All right, Mr. Stivers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen, for the overview and the, the information here. I'm a big fan of having shovel ready projects, so I'm certainly supportive of doing this. Uh, I have a question about the how. Is this something that um, we're going to use our usual engineering firm to do all of this, or is there opportunity to bundle all of this work together and go out to get a bid on a, a bulk contract for all of this work and maybe find a way to get somebody who's willing to do an acceptable job for a lower budget at some point here? Um, this, this work, at least for a quarter of a Can't hear you, Karen. Karen, we lost you. We lost you, can't hear. You're sort of still frozen. 
that if we do any of the survey work that we were kind of talking about at the end, that hasn't been um, that hasn't been started yet. Uh, Karen, we missed a lot of that. Couldn't hear you. We, you froze and and uh, um, so I think you're going to have to start at the beginning. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. I have must have bad internet. I'm sorry. Um, so the Corderville Road has already started design. We've already vetted some um, some of the project with with residents. Um, the downtown Main Street's also far into design already. So those projects, I couldn't go. Um, we, we'd stay with who we have, who is our road engineer. Um, if we did decide to do any of the survey work, that work could possibly, we could go with them um, to look and see if there is um, another engineering firm that we wanted to use. I, I will say uh, we have had really good luck with the guys that we use and um, they you. might not be the cheapest, but they're, they're very, um, they're very good. Yeah. Um, Quality and price, both issues, certainly. So I defer to you or others to make the best choice there. All right. Thanks. To my question. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Braccio. Thank you. Good evening, Karen. Just a couple quick questions. Um, one, the $30,000 from in the general fund from Legacy Farms, was that received? Yes. Or And when, Mr. Purple, maybe this is a question for you. When was this received? And um, again, I'm not quite sure the process. Would this have had to have been approved at town meeting to receive the funds from this or no? No. No, okay. this was two years ago Karen I'm not I'm not sure okay. if it's two years. It, it, it might have been last summer because we had to wait for a town meeting so that we could put it somewhere and there was um there was that and and then we had seven thousand dollars for sidewalk work for um a project actually out of uh, Oregon that also went into the general, general fund whenever money like that happens it goes in the general fund and then we have to reallocate it to us. And I, I, I don't know if it got done at town meeting. I don't know where it would have been to look for it. I don't know if that money was reallocated out of, out of general fund back to sidewalks. So it probably still continues to carry through. Okay. Okay. So that actually leads me to my second question is that um, I know when some of the subdivisions go in, and sidewalks aren't built within the subdivisions, they're supposed to be built elsewhere in town. So specifically, you just mentioned Oregon. So $7,000 was the offset to the town instead of building sidewalks somewhere else. And how do you come up with that figure? Um, so for that one, one of the biggest problems we have it, as a town is that it costs us more to do work because of prevailing wages. So we basically have to use a, like the means book and say, this is what, um, this is what a sidewalk would cost the developer to build this sidewalk, um, you know, in his development. So based on that, and a lot of the work would, they already would have to do a lot of it because of the way, just the way construction works. So some of like, you can't, include 100% of the sidewalk work because there's some sort of curbing still there and there's some other work that now gets pulled out of the sidewalk. And so the, the total cost is based on the work that would be done just for sidewalks. And um, because they're not a prevailing wage, it costs us probably double to do the same length of, of sidewalk as it would cost a contractor, um, a developer, sorry. So are you confident, I, I would imagine that this, this subdivision um, isn't the only subdivision that this concession has been made in and replacing sidewalks. Is, is that something you track or how, are you comfortable that there are no other projects that, you know, sidewalks in lieu of sidewalks um, being built or a, a payment being made to the town? Are you fairly comfortable that, that we're on top of this and, um, yeah, yeah, no, we, um, okay. because, because I wanted to use it, so I, yeah, we're, we're pretty good about keeping track of it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Malinowski. So just to follow up on, on that, but once we get the money, then we have to appropriate it so that Karen can use it for sidewalks? Yes. 
Okay. So that has to happen through town meeting. So do you have a bucket then that you need to transfer over to, to sidewalk fund? I believe, I believe so. And I, I don't, I don't know how it works, unfortunately, because we actually haven't had a lot of this. Um, usually DPW doesn't get um, donations. So um, the 30,000 and the seven um, need to just be put into basically, I think we were going to allocate it into road maintenance. But I'm not, but I don't think it did happen now that Mark, I think, is confirming that. Okay. And then going forward, we, I assume we would put it into the new sidewalk maintenance bucket instead of road maintenance. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so then I had a few questions. Um, the 145 in your description, it says it's going to be allocated for permitting final des detailed design bid plans and specs, as well as bid and construction phase engineering assistance and oversight. Um, and then at the bottom, it says that it's it's the design. So are you assuming that the design includes everything that was listed in the bullet point above? Yes. So okay. they, we're pretty far into design. So it's more of a final design okay. that we're trying to finish. And um, there are hearings that are required to do this project or no? Um, we we do generally a project this size. We we would meet with the residents, the uh, you know the um, abutters, um, but there will be um, with conservation. So that's the permitting that we'd have to get is with conservation. Okay. So do you have to do do you have to spend the one forty five and do those items in order to do the hearings and then get ready, or they happen simultaneously? Um, the one forty five helps us with the hearings, and we'll do the hearings. And then we'll continue on beyond that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shea. <clears throat> uh, nothing beyond that, which has been asked already. All right. So, Karen, on on the first item, you are looking for us to allocate one hundred and forty-five thousand dollars of Chapter ninety funds for the items detailed in the bullet point. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, is there a motion to that effect? So moved. All right. I'll second. Additional discussion. Hearing none, Ms. Braccio. Aye. Ms. Malinowski. Aye. Mr. Shea. Aye. Mr. Stivers. Aye. And Mr. Healy is aye. All right. That is That allocation is approved uh, unanimously. And now on to downtown Main Street, a little bit thornier. Yeah, this, um, a lot of people ask about this, which is why I kind of got a little more detailed about what this project includes. Um, so when you get to our downtown, obviously we have a lot of restrictions with space. Um, and then there's the CSX tracks, which is, causes us a little bit of issue. Um, but this project has been has been really put together. But we, if we don't have CSX, we can't get shovel ready on that section. So that's the first piece. Um, however, we have the Newton Street sidewalk, which we do need to vet a little more with residents. But that sidewalk, we're extending the sidewalk from the end of the TIP project down Corderville Road from where it, basically where the TIP project ends to the northern entrance at the cemetery. That's part of this project. So it's, it's a very, it's almost like we spurred off of the Main Street. So you have this Main Street project and then we spurred south on Corderville. We spurred east on Main Street. Then we spur north on Marlboro Road. So that's still 85, obviously. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do there is increase the sidewalk. Um, length to get it all the way past the library up to St. Mark Street. Um, and part of that, and I know everybody has been through that puddle at the corner of St. Mark Street and, and 85 right across from um, St. Mark's school's driveway. Um, what we're looking at doing, we have a preliminary design to actually kind of move that intersection. And that's actually what I'm asking for the money for. So under the Main Street 
money that's actually already allocated towards the main street project we we can use that for design and we can still also use that um for when construction starts so we're kind of good with that piece but we we haven't allocated anything for the st mark street um and that's where i actually wanted to get this this because we do need to obviously fix that puddle we want to put some do some shared parking with the library and with St. Mark Street. We're trying to kind of make um, make that corridor more walkable through other areas, right? So we'll be able to ultimately once me, um, once we do our complete streets priority list, I, I believe 85 will end up on it to get north on 85 up to Ledge Hill, probably all the way to the bridge where we then have um, sidewalk on Marlboro Road all the way up to um, really basically to the light. So this is just to, to, to sort of finish the piece from where it ends at the tip to St. Mark Street. So um, this 105,000 gets us the design and, and um, gets us the spec to put into the rest of the project. So it's one big project and we kind of can sort of leave that area alone for a while so people can stop having to deal with construction for another year, you know, more and more years. Does that make any sense? I think so. Okay. Let me ask a couple of quick, quick questions. Then Lisa, I'm going to go to you. Um, so is the 105 in addition to the 1.4 million or is it part of the 1.4 million? It's, it's in addition um, because St. Mark street really um, did it, it's, it's beyond, it's really beyond any of the main street allocations. So it, it, um, I feel yeah, like it's no, 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 that's fine. I just, I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, or, or, or educate myself into which bucket um, okay. it might be coming out of. So that's number one. Number two, um, that um, area at the, that, that intersection, uh, and maybe it's, maybe I'm hallucinating a little bit, mm -hmm. but it seems to have gotten a lot worse in the last year or 18 months. Is, 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 is are my observations correct? You're correct. Um, when and, seeing... and all right, that's question number one. So yes, question number two: What is, is it getting? Is is the deterioration? Um, um, was any work done in that area by St. Mark's or someone else responsible for the deterioration and the and the situation getting worse, or did something else contribute to it? Um, it 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 is from the stone wall. Um, and the work they did at that intersection because the water used to flow onto their land and well into that area, which actually is not its old right of way at this point um, and puddle up, but it puddled up there. But now what we're, what we're looking at doing is because that's not a great turn for the fire trucks and for, um, to begin with, we're looking at actually by fixing the drainage by actually moving the dr moving the road and perhaps doing some sort of a um, a license for St. Mark's to use the right of way and they give us an easement to put a right of way on their property and we could fix that intersection so it's much more um, drivable so it's better for the traveling public but then we can fix we can also um, do a better intersection for um, drainage and then we can also do um, better parking area and actually do a real parking area that we could share with St. Mark's which would be beneficial I think because we've taken parking from the downtown area. All right good and um, at least I'm going to go with you just a second. Um, Mark who's or Karen either who's having these discussions with St. Mark's about the easement because I'd like to wrap them into some other discussions uh, particularly since I had a feeling that 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 the the issue um, uh, there might have been tied to some extent to the work that was done on the wall, and now the town is needing to address that. So, who, who's having the discussions about the easement with St. Marks? We we haven't really done anything. I've shown them the plan just to make them aware of it, um, and with the idea that I needed to talk to the selectmen first before we could go any further with anything and actually make ask them to make an official discussion, you know, sit and really look at it and talk about it. Okay. Um, all right, so so when you say we, are those discussions, who's gonna be involved in those discussions with St. Mark's? I have not 
I haven't done anything except we're not there yet. So, okay. so, so nobody at this point. All right. Well, when we get to that point, I, I want to tie it into some other discussions with, uh, with St. Mark's. So I'm done, Lisa, to you. Great. Thank you. Actually, the, the, the uh, stone wall was one of the questions that I had too. Um, just one other question, Karen, that the town is hoping to use money from the safe routes to school to fund some of the sidewalk work. Um, it's not clear if this grant application will open or how much the grant um, will fund. So we don't have any idea of, of what um, the cost of that may be or what benefit we may get from that grant. Obviously, because we haven't applied, but so you're right. not you're not putting a dollar figure attached to this yet. It's no, no. Okay. Um, basically, I'm hoping that um, I, I do believe it's going to open because I have seen some some information about it, but I haven't seen a start like an open date. It seems to be usually around January, which is when everyone thinks it's going to be all this money. So I, I don't know. Maybe there'll be more, um, but we'll take whatever we can and get as many done as we can. And then if we can free up any of that money that's in chapter 94 Main Street, the downtown once that then then we can use obviously that elsewhere. We can just talk to DOT and get it changed over to a different project. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Ms. Malinowski. Thank you. Um, I just have a general question, I think about all three projects. So when you add it all up, it's a decent amount of money. So who's going to have the oversight of the spending of it? Um, the way most of this works generally is that it's signed off on, like the bills are signed off by me because it's construction. The um, But first the engineer actually checks all, you know, checks the numbers and everything to make sure that we're not paying for something that wasn't done we obviously know what's been done or what's not done well. And then at that point, um, also the town accountant has obviously a lot of responsibility to make sure that the money and the funds are where they are supposed to be. But um, okay. if that's, that's generally the way it's always worked at this point. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, Brian? I was just also gonna comment that uh, with the work at this intersection at St. Mark's Road and 85, I think that the two major beneficiaries of this will be the town and St. Mark's. And I think it's a great opportunity for a public-private partnership to, to work together to, to make this work well for, for both entities. And I encourage those discussions. And Mr. Stivers. Thanks, I'm all set, thank you. All right, so Karen, um, you are looking for a $105,000 allocation of Chapter 90 funds, correct? Yes. Um, for um, St. Mark's Street Design, is that sufficient um, designation for the money? Yes. All right, I'll move that. Second. Second. All right, seconded by, I think Mr. Styra has got there first. Discussion, none. Ms. Braccio? Aye. Ms. Malinowski? Aye. Mr. Shea? Aye. Mr. Stivers? Aye. And Mr. Healy is aye. Uh, that's unanimous as well, Karen. And now Route 85 and Framingham Road survey. Um, so this is, um, this is very much more proactive than the town usually is. So just get that one ready. Um, just, just the right of you can't do any design without a good survey in, in the town. The right of way doesn't change much, so you can get a survey. And basically, once you have it, you can just spot check where things have changed. Once you have it, if you go to to a design work, um, the 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 route from the Marlboro Town Line through ta through the intersection lights of Marlboro and Marlboro, and it's technically Newton Street, but everyone calls it Framingham Road, um, and then turns into Framingham Road and to, to the Boston Road Causeway. That whole, that whole corridor there, we have a lot of right of way. We could, we could actually do a really good tip project with that um, if we 
got our survey together. And even if we don't, um, if, if, you know, no one wants to kind of dive into that right away in terms of, um, in, in, in term, in terms of actually doing the, doing the project or funding that, or, you know, we can at least get started by having that survey. We can do small projects off it if money does become available next spring, or we can do, um, or we can just pull into one big long tip project. We can split it into two, three tip projects, but that acre bridge intersection, we know needs a lot of work and, um, you know, we can even pull that out separately. So that's, like I said, it's, it's sort of a, gee, if we do all of this survey, we have a lot, we almost have like a, what's it called? Like a buffet that we can pick off of, right? And decide what, what projects we might wanna do and not do on that quarter. And then say, you know what, while we're waiting for the tip to, if we are, do, do wanna do a tip project, but we could, you know, fix this intersection in the meantime. And so that's, that was the, the concept of this. It's very, um, not something that we've ever done before. All right, Karen, you no need to be defensive. I mean, you, you are, you are calling our bluff, um, in a good way. I mean, basically we, we, we effectively told you to be proactive and identify projects and, um, uh, you know, let us know what sort of work would be needed to get those projects shovel ready. And, and not surprisingly, um, it costs some money on the front end. And so I, I applaud you for being um, proactive and for identifying, you know, some, some, some work that can be done at the front end to, you know, make a tip project, you know, uh, more quickly viable you know, and, and, uh, or, or if other money becomes available to be able to deal with it on, on, on a road that clearly needs some work. So don't be defensive. You're doing exactly the right thing. So, um, and with that, I'll go to Ms. Malinowski. Um, I agree. This is, this is great. I think this is exactly what we wanted you, um, to do. So my one question is if we have the survey done and we decide to do part or none of it for, three to four years when we get a TIP project or something, um, do we need to redo the survey or this will stand until we actually do it and you just need to update um, as needed? It, based on that road, it should stand and we would probably just knew, need to do a little bit of updating because some stuff might change a little, but it won't be anything significant because our right of way doesn't change much. Okay, okay thank you. All right, Mr. Shea. No questions on this one. Mr. Stivers. As before, I strongly support this. Uh, I'd suggest it might be interesting as we go through this process, assuming this one gets approved as well, to start communicating with our legislators who I've heard on multiple occasions say the importance of shovel ready projects. So even though we have not done the engineering yet, it might be interesting to put together a list for Representative Dykeman, Senator Eldridge, to say, here's what we have in the pipeline. Here's roughly what we think it's gonna to cost to do it once we get the engineering done, if we can make some ballpark estimates. And by the way, we can break up these projects in a couple of different ways. So if you run across opportunities for funding for these, these types of projects and these types of amounts, please keep us in mind, talk to us, and we'll work to see what we can prepare for you to let them know, again, what's out there, just in case they run across something. I think that could be helpful. So that's all for me. No, Sam, that's a great idea. And Mark, when, when did we last, again, August, September, and October, a bit of a blur. Um, but when did, when did we last have um, our now newly you know, reelected rep and state senator in for a conversation? Was it this summer? Or I, I want to I want to say it was May, May June something like that. Um, okay. I wasn't on board. Just to clarify, I think it's been a blur since March, but that may just be. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't we do I, I, following up on Mr. Stiver's um, suggestion? Why don't we issue an invitation? Um, we can congratulate them on getting reelected and uh, uh, give them a bit of a wish list. And we could remind them the town voted overwhelmingly for them. <laughs> All right, and with that, Ms. Braccio. Just quickly, Karen, I, I, I think this is all, I, I second the comments that have been made tonight. I think Acres Bridge, you couldn't have picked a better, more problematic intersection to, to actually look to do something for. So uh, I appreciate it and thank you. All right, so Karen, you are looking for um, uh, 
you know, door number three, $130,000 of chapter 90 money for a Route 85 and Framingham Road survey. Did I get that right? Yes. So moved. Second. All right, Mr. Shea seconds. Discussion, none. Ms. Braccio. Aye. Ms. Malinowski. Aye. Mr. Shea. Aye. Mr. Stivers. Aye. And Mr. Healy is aye, unanimous. Um, those are your three items. Karen, can, can we just talk a little bit about um, CSX and downtown? Absolutely. And where things are oh, and, uh, or are not? Okay. Since I have you too, um, they're paving tomorrow now, right? We had the cold weather, we had the rain, tomorrow Main Street, um, and then Friday Main Street, a little bit of landscaping. Next year, they'll be back, finish up any landscaping and do the crosswalks. They'll be um, striping next week, likely, or that's their goal. So it's gonna look mostly done. Yay. Great. One quick thing, and, and while I have my cohort from the Main Street group here, Mr. Shea, I, you can tell me, or Brian, you can weigh in and others can weigh in. Uh, when a big, a big part, part of the discussion when we were doing the project was obviously a number of trees were gonna be taken down. Um, and there was a discussion that, that I, I think it was two to one. I might have the ratio wrong, but, but two to one, um, you know, trees were gonna be replaced for those that have been taken down. I will tell you, and this is, uh, people can disagree with me. I actually think that Main Street looks terrific without the trees that were planted along the side um, near, near the St. Mark's lawn and along the uh, strip mall. And so I guess, it, it, is it worth a discussion about whether or not we leave that more open or in fact, plant some trees? That's my aesthetic on, <laughs> on, 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 on the way Main Street looks now and, and whether or not it makes sense to, to put some trees there. And I understand there may be disagreement. So but that's my view of it. And I am not getting universal support. So, so Karen, the plan is, that is part of the landscaping for next spring, that would be when trees would be put in, the trees that were called out in the plan? Um, I think they're actually gonna put a lot of them in this fall, actually. Um, I know it, it's a little chilly, so I, I don't know. I think they've got a good a week or two, but then I, I'm not sure. So, um, mm -hmm. and they do own them for a year, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe they're gonna try to do as many as they can now. Uh, maybe a little, a little bit late to the party, but that, again, that's my, that's my aesthetic observation. I think it really looks nice more, yeah. open, but anyway. Observation noted, I would just say, given the vast number of meetings that were held with so many impacted parties, I would certainly discourage a vote tonight to eliminate <laughs> those trees. <laughs> I, thought we, I thought we had till the spring. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I like trees. When when is Mr. Healy going to be out of town, Karen? So we can yeah. planting. We can plant some more. We are going around with window. my. I would go going around my saw, taking them down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, I, I I hijacked you from talking about CSX. I did it first, so I hijacked first. Um, so the downtown, the CSX. Um, and if you if anyone has been tuning in on any of the planning boards when they the planning board meetings when they were talking about the parcel downtown, um, you heard them talking about drainage and all these other problems, which I didn't really realize anyone was having basement issues over there. I've never called about that, but um, we are looking at putting under the tracks, um, replacing the the drainage pipe in there putting a new drainage system in there. We're replacing the water main. Um, so we have an easement that we need from uh, CSX. CSX actually owns the right of way there. We have an easement across their right of way for the road. Um, also because of the sidewalks, um, the crossing, crossing right of way is a little different also because really the sidewalk doesn't continue across their road, uh, across their right of way. So, um, ADA wise, there's some issues. So we, we have everything um, designed and ready to go. We've sent it to CSX. We've been back and forth many times with them. And we're now clear they're ready to give us a, an easement. However, um, because of the 
in, infringements. Is that the word I'm looking for? Like, people, people on their property, uh, their yeah, property. Is infringement? Encroachment. I, en encroachment. Okay. Encroachment, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like wouldn't come. Um, so these encroachments. Uh, yeah. Oop, we lost. I lost her anyways. Karen, we lost you again. Karen. <laughs> I can't hear you. No one can hear you. Okay. Oh, now we can. Oh, okay, good. Talk fast. So, yeah, <laughs> that's the problem, right? All right, so the encroachments, um, the C CSX wants us to either help, help them fix these encroachments, which they'll only give really five feet of easement to any of these properties on any side. So their right of way is 30 feet from their center line of the tracks, but they're willing to go to 25 feet with this easement. Um, what's happening or becomes a problem is that if, if we can't get that worked out, um, they want us just to put curbing across their easement so that the trains get by, but there's no way cars or anything can, can access their right of way from the roadway. If that, does that make sense? Um, it does. And, um, this is, this is the item that Mr. Shea sent a letter to landowners um, four or five months ago. Um, uh, th th this is my view. I think um, my sense is that, um, um, I mean, I had a conversation serendipitously with Mr. Lamy, who's a property owner there. Um, and he, he, he resolved the issue, his issues with um, CSX, I think pretty modestly. Um, um, and I don't know what the other, how the other landowners are situated. I, I suspect there may be one who responded and, and, and said that, that he thought that there was some adverse possession that, that was going to impact it. That's, that's a tough legal hill to climb, especially against a railroad. Um, but I guess my inclination would be to toss this, um, Mr. Purple to you and to, to, to line it up for us and find out exactly what the view of the. The, the landowners are so that we have that information in front of us and can make a decision about the best path forward for us. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, important yeah. to get this resolved or moving toward resolution for a variety of reasons. Yeah, uh -huh. and again, recognizing and and technically, I think it was I think you sent the letter, but it's like oh, did some I? of my <laughs> finest work that I do in my uh, in my day job is I author letters that other people get to sign and <laughs> <laughs> to people. I think this was another one of those. But in any case, we're, I think all five of us looked at the letter, approved the letter, we're all in this. That 25 foot limitation that CSX has, you know, really presents an adverse impact to the properties that are on the west side of the, of the track uh, to to tomorrow's and to the Knights of Columbus property. And, you know, I know that I have been contacted by and have spoken with uh, representatives from the Knights of Columbus property. And I think that they're trying to engage in conversations with CSX. Um, but that, you know, I just hope something can, can happen to that there's a little bit of flexibility, you know, more flexibility on CSX's part so as not to have such an adverse impact on those businesses, on those Here's, structures. And again, and I don't want to, and, and Chris Lamy, if I'm, if I'm misstating, um, but I believe the way that he resolved it with CSX is he's paying a, an incredibly modest um, annual rental payment. That's how it's resolved. Um, in other words, the, I, CSX, CSX did not insist that, um, you know, access and egress was going to be um, um, adversely affected, but they wanted to assert their property rights. Yeah. Um, now, so I guess, so I guess I'm back to where I was. L let's find out exactly where things stand with, with all of the, those property owners so that we can make a de determination about what the best way forward is for us. And then hopefully for the, for the project down there because it is it, it's going to look nice till the the you know 
middle of the uh, of South Barajas of Pizza, um, and we've got to uh, we've got to address that. I think it'll I think it'll help all the businesses down there too when we address that. And Marty, yeah, can I offer a suggestion? Um, I've I've actually seen in other circumstances exactly that kind of arrangement work. And I wonder if there are other arrangements that are typical for this kind of a situation that uh, we might uh, um, inquire. I don't know who the experts are in this world, but inquire about and offer some possibilities to the, those property owners. Who, they may not have thought of some other possibilities here. I don't know if we could help be proactive in that process, as opposed to asking CSX, you know, what are you willing to do kind of thing. We had a couple of suggestions of, of approaches that worked in other circumstances that might uh, break the log jam a little bit. I don't know what those might be, but I got to believe there are people who deal in that kind of stuff all the time and might have some suggestions. So maybe Mr. Purple could check around with other towns to see if there's experience that's worked that we could somehow prime the pump a little bit here. You're muted, Marty. Muted, Marty, yeah. But Sorry it was eloquent. Um, Mr. Purple, could, does that make sense to do basically two things? Number one, touch base with the property owners and find out exactly where things stand with CSX. Um, and number two, um, uh, yeah, we're not the only town that has a, has train tracks, um, going through it where there are, uh, where the, where the, the, um, um, the train has property rights and, and see if there are some creative ways that maybe have, it's been addressed in some other towns. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. Okay. All right. Anything else for, for Karen? Karen, I think you are free to go. Thank you very much. Appreciate All right. you guys making All right. Thank decisions. you, Karen. Bye. All right. Next item is discussion of process for receiving, assigning, tracking litigation. And obviously, this is something that was brought up um, um, in in general terms um, um, last year when I was when I wanted to get my hands on paper. Um, and obviously became more acute um, um, this summer with uh, stuff that happened with the Warfield litigation. Now, let me draw a line down the middle. Warfield matter is in litigation. So to the extent we're gonna, that's why we added an executive session item on. To the extent there are questions about that because they might implicate uh, attorney-client privilege um, discussions, they may implicate uh, strategic decisions that were made and, and might have to be made going forward other than in very general terms, let's avoid those in public session. So let's talk first about the tracking system. Um, and th there is a, a few glitches to it. And, and I spoke with Ms. Braccio and Mr. Purple earlier today about some of those. But Mark, why don't you describe what it is you've set up and, and how it will uh, knock on wood, prevent any sort of reoccurrence of, of what happened with Warfield. Sure, so let me talk um, a little bit about, um, you know, how we do, you know, generally you know, um, you know, since I've been here, how we've handled lawsuits, and then some of the tweaks we've made, I think, to address some of the things that um, Mr. Healy has has indicated with with um, um, that that suit this summer. So when the town is served with a lawsuit, it normally comes one of two ways, either the town clerk's office is served, or the board of selectmen's office is served. Um, and then at that point, um, you know, the, um, the lawsuit is passed uh, onto town council. Town Council then has, um, usually within 48 hours, um, makes a determination and a recommendation on his assignment on who should be defending the lawsuit. Um, usually, I would say the majority of the cases end up getting passed to Insurance Council. Um, and if uh, Town Council does defer it to Insurance Council, then it does go to um, Lori Esposito, the executive assistant in our office. Um, she is the conduit with the insurance company. Um, she works with them to have counsel assigned uh, from the insurance company. Sometimes it's a particular matter that may be um, um, more um, better handled by labor counsel. Uh, and sometimes um, town council may see that he's got a conflict. And so um, he will recommend that it is assigned a special counsel. Um, once additional counsel has been assigned, um, then we make town council aware as to who the attorney has been assigned and he helps to coordinate 
anything that that attorney may need, you know, on the handoff or as you move forward with, um, with the case. The board is also made aware of who the assigned counsel is um, because then from time to time, the board will ask to meet with counsel to get updated on the case, to talk about strategy. And, and those discussions happen obviously in executive session. As the case moves forward um, until it is concluded, um, you know, the attorneys will provide us documents um, and updates and filings and things like that on the case. Um, because this board, um, as I think the chair said earlier, is data driven. Um, you know, we have, um, and, and, and I say we, but I will say Tom um, has, has helped to set up and, and I've been the willing um, uh, victim to set up a OneDrive for um, the legal filings. So we have uh, folders for the legal cases uh, and all of the correspondence that comes in, all of the pleadings, um, email correspondence, uh, things of that nature are all um, put into folders on the legal drive, um, on the one drive that we have. And that access is shared with all of the board of selectmen members so that you can go in and that you can see everything. Um, that is one of the, 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 the nuances that we've, that, we've, um, that we've done to make sure that everybody has access to everything. One of the other, other things that we've done at the front end of the process is that um, to provide some redundancy when the cases come in and to make sure that everybody is aware um, as quickly as possible. Um, when, a, um, when the town is served with, um, with a lawsuit, um, electronic copies of that are gonna be provided um, if it's coming from the clerk's office or from our office, um, will be provided to all of the selectmen's office staff, to the board of selectmen and to town council uh, electronically so that everybody is in um, on the front end of those documents and the town clerk um, had sent um, me an email indicating that that was, um, that was something that uh, he would do uh, moving forward. Um, I think that is pretty much a broad brush of how we do what we do. Um, like I said, the OneDrive is new um, and um, I've already been um, uh, apprised of, of a glitch. Um, I was having a conversation with Ms. Malinowski uh, earlier, and then I vetted what she had told me with Ms. Braccio and Mr. Healy later in the morning. And there is an issue with a sinking um, that for some reason you, you can't dive into um, some of the information on the drives are um, what I like to call like Russian nesting dolls. So it's an email with maybe another email or several emails inside of it, which may have attachments inside of those. And um, it was pointed out to me that we're not able to um, to access the OneDrive and drill down into some of that information. So I'm working with Tom to try and get a fix for that. Something's wrong with the syncing. I'm not sure what, but I but all the access has been provided. So um, we'll um, we'll get that cleaned up. The one question I have for the board is that um, unlike um, if there's updates that are made on the town website, you sign up for updates in a certain section. If something's updated, you get a notice. So you know that something's been updated. If I'm adding files into a particular case file, you're not aware of it. Um, and so as, because it, you know, it is a little bit redundant, but you know, if the board, you know, um, if it makes it easier for the board, you know, I can, um, you know, email the board either that there are updates to a certain file or can just simply send you the documents and then at the same time insert them, you know, into the into the case files, um, depending on whichever is easier just to ensure that, you know, you're kept up to date when things come in. All right. Um, why don't we start with Ms. Braccio and we could talk. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give me a chance to think about that um, uh, in terms of what sort of notice might be um, the best. Lisa? Um, I, I always appreciate process. So um, I, I'm glad that some of the new things that have been put in place, I, I appreciate the, the legal folder and being able to go in that. As far as updates, I definitely think we need to find a way and what's the easiest way? I mean, I don't know that necessarily every time you put a, a piece of paper in a file mark, I mean, I, I don't know that I necessarily want to be um, notified. You know, again, that could that could lead to way too many emails that we already get anyway. So um, I'd be curious to see what the rest of the board thinks about that. Um, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I know more specifics we'll, we'll deal with under executive session, so. 
That's right, it Ms. for me. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Ms. Malinowski. So Mark, did you say that there was an, an option so that we would get an email automatically when you add something to a folder? No, so that, I, I'm sorry, I, I not to confuse the issue, but if, if you sign up for like, you know, news flash or updates for minutes on the town website, yeah. And you get those you get those updates so that when something happens, then you're automatically notified that there's been a change. But we don't have something like that for the OneDrive. It would make it much easier if we did. So I don't think that there's a lot of value in you sending the file again, like to our email. I think to have it in the OneDrive is kind of the point is to have a consolidated effort so that you're not having to send out files. Um, I I think the, the challenge is if you do add something to a folder, how do we know to, that there's something new in there? Well, I think that you, when you go in and take a look at, um, when you go in and take a look at the OneDrive, you'll yeah. see the date it's been modified. Yeah. So obviously if, if the date is newer or if it's today's date, um, you know, you're going to see the ones that have been, that have been added to more recently. So does it, does the modified date change at the actual um, folder level, like the highest level so that you don't have to drill down and see the modified date on the file? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Sorry. So is, do you know if the modified date is at the folder level and not on the file level? I believe it is at the folder level and not the file level. Okay. Okay. If that's the case, I think... I would be comfortable with just logging in, you know, once a week and seeing which folders had been modified and then going in and seeing what's been added. Okay. Mr. Shea. Yeah, I think I would be good with, um, you know, just having it, you know, incumbent upon each of us to go in and, and see what's, what's new. Obviously there may be some you know, cases that have more interest to others uh, or others may have more activity going on at any particular time that may warrant us going in with more frequency. Um, but I think just making sure that we have the, you know, the information there on the OneDrive, it's then incumbent upon us to, to go find it. Mr. Stivers. Uh, I agree. Having the information available is important. Great step forward. Uh, one thing you might consider is, uh, Mark, you often send us a weekly update at the end of the week. Uh, maybe including in that a note that, uh, you know, here's six documents that have been added or something to at least alert us to what's going on there. Or particularly if there's something that's uh, uh, unusual, important, or whatever there that's been updated, just to uh, uh, remind us of that, uh, that could be helpful too. Sure. Thank yeah, and, and Mark, I don't want to put 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 you know sort of rigid guidelines together of uh, about you know specific items. Uh, you know, leaving, leave it to your judgment that there are specific items that I would give us immediate notice about. Yes. Um, you know, the filing of a complaint, um, uh, you know, obviously if a judgment comes down, um, but, but, you know, it's like pornography. I, I know, <laughs> I, I know an important document when I see it. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I am, I am, I am comfortable leaving that determination to you to, to get that, you know, an important document in our hands sooner rather than later. Other than that, uh, at, uh, uh, you know, an end of the week update, including it, you know, in your town administrator report, say, by the way, there's been a decent amount of activity in this particular lawsuit or in this matter, I think it'd be, from, from my view, would be sufficient. Well, obviously when you, when the, you know, when litigation is filed, you're going to get that, you know, you're going to, that, that's not going to be something that you're going to have to go and check for. You're going to get that. Here's a new, you know, um, uh, something new that's been filed against the town. And now, you know, we'll create the folder and then any correspondence regarding that will then be added to the folder. So you'll, you'll be notified on the front end. And then, um, yes, obviously the major milestones in that, I'll make sure the board is aware of those as we go along. Well, the tracking system is great. When are we gonna do the litigation elimination system to prevent all the litigation? <laughs> Uh, That'd be great. Yeah, that would be great. Next month. All right. Anything else? Um, uh, uh, public session relating to this? No. Uh, all right. We are done with three and we are going on to four, um, our reports. Um, 
and um, I will I will zip through a bunch of, of items, two of them that are listed there. I'm going to get to those last. I've got some initial things. Um, number one, I, I've been kidding people that I because I had because I visited my mom in Rhode Island, um, <clears throat> I had to vote by myself yesterday. Um, and uh, but but Subutka was 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 wonderful in 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 arranging it. But um, because I did vote in person, I had the opportunity to see again um, what a terrific job the town clerk's office does with that. And of course, we all know and and um, I just want to let folks in the town know that the person responsible for that, primarily responsible that for that, Mr. Haggerty, um, while he was doing work on it on Saturday, took a really bad fall. Um, and as a result, couldn't be on site um, from Saturday until I don't think he got home until election day itself. Um, my understanding is he's doing fine, um, but he did take a pretty good bump on his head um, from the ice. So um, Jim, from I'm sure the entire board, uh, we wish you well and another incredibly well done job on um, a tough election uh, cycle. Um, uh, number two, uh, uh, our um, townhouse receptionist, uh, administrative assistant, Carol Ostrich is um, retiring. Um, so congratulations to her. We'll do something maybe formal at one of our meetings in the next couple of weeks, but just, I wanna wish her well on her uh, impending retirement. Um, number three, we are, um, and we're gonna have an executive session probably on Tuesday, um, the capital, um, committee is, I think today or very soon getting appraisals for the art center property. So we'll have the opportunity to discuss with them and review um, the appraisals that, um, that come in. Um, in terms of our goals and, and procedures generally, again, the last few months have been um, sort of brutal in terms of uh, various items of business, but hopefully on November 17th, we'll get back to having some of our committees come in and talk about their goals for the year. Um, um, so our next regular meeting is November 17th and hopefully we'll have a number of, of committees in that day. Uh, reminder, uh, special meeting on next Tuesday to talk about the downtown zoning um, issues. Um, probably tomorrow, I was gonna do it tonight, but I, I, I decided not to, and that is to talk about specific liaisons. I've broken them down, had a nice conversation with Ms. Mal Malinowski about her um, uh, uh, idea for how these would work. Um, I've assigned three um, uh, departments or boards to each person. Um, if you have a problem with one of them, let me know and uh, I can juggle them around a little bit and uh, uh, baby steps. That's why I'm starting with three. Let's see how that works in the uh, short to medium term. And, and uh, you know, if it, if it works great, then, then it becomes a normal part of our process going forward. Um, and fine, not finally before, I, finally, before I get to the two listed items, um, I was the board's representative at, at the first financial meeting with the schools and advisory, Mr. Purple, the finance team, uh, a week ago Monday, and it was very preliminary. But, but uh, you know, at least right now, um, all of our oars are um, pulling in the same direction, and we seem to be on the same page for for what fiscal year 21, 21, 22, um, the challenges that we're going to be facing. And then finally, um, the two items listed. Um, Mr. Purple, uh, Betsy Rosenblum, chair of the personnel board and I sat down last Thursday, um, might've been Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday, Thursday, um, and had a very productive, um, at least from my perspective, and I think from others' perspective, um, hour long meeting, we covered an awful lot of territory relating to the, the intersection and interplay between the town administrator position, the personnel director hat uh, that he wears and the personnel boards, um, duties, responsibilities, including oversight of the personnel director um, for, for items relating to the salary administration plan. Um, the two specific action items that, that came out of that, and we're gonna have a follow-up meeting as well. Um, the, the, the two um, action items were number one, that uh, uh, you know, consistent with the, the approach we've taken with the police department, with the fire department, and are talking with others about uh, um, Mr. Purple will be making monthly, is that what we agreed on, Mark? Monthly reports 
um, at the personnel board meetings about items relating to the salary administration plan, to the policies that have been adopted by the personnel board, and any um, personnel matters that fall under that um, broad umbrella. And the, um, the second thing is, um, Ms. Rosenblum brought up the, the want of the um, personnel board to um, be kept firmer in the loop on um, hiring with the perfectly you know, reasonable and legitimate concern that sometimes um, in, the, in the, you know, the sort of heat of the night, um, uh, discussions can go on during the hiring process about um, hiring conditions, um, you know, specifics of employment, et cetera, that the personnel board may view um, as inconsistent with or that have to be um, brought into consistency with their policies, with the salary administration plan, et cetera. And so again, consistent with what we've done in a lot of other areas, um, there will be any time a decision is made in the hiring area or the, prom the promotion area where there are new um, uh, uh, conditions um, of employment that there will be notice to the personnel board so that if necessary, they can pull themselves together for either to put it on their agenda for a regularly scheduled meeting or if need be, have an emergency meeting to address anything that falls, again, within what clearly is their jurisdiction. So, Marty. Yes, Marty, where did that come from? Sam. Sam, okay. Can I make two suggestions about that as follow up? Sure. Um, one is uh, given Ms. Rosenblum's presentation um, at our recent meeting, um, I would suggest it might be interesting for us to hear from the personnel board uh, quarterly or whatever in terms of how they view the ongoing processes working to get updates to those concerns that we heard to make sure we're making progress from their perspective. Second thing, uh, given that uh, Mr. Purple is in an interesting position here, having two masters in this case, um, it seems to me it might be useful to get input from the personnel board in terms of his performance appraisal as well in a more formal way, since again, he plays an important role there and I think that would be relevant input. So something that we, I think, could, might consider for both of those. Okay, anything else on that item? And then I'm gonna go on to my last one. I, I have a question, Marty. Yep. Did, um, did you discuss the org chart at all? I know that was one item that Betsy had brought up um, and it sounded like maybe it, it's a little outdated, but um, maybe a good starting point. Is that something that we could kind of work through with personnel board to get a, an accurate town org chart? Um, the answer is no. Um, and not by any, any um, decision other than um, I had a relatively hard stop after an hour. And so we covered the ground we covered. Um, but there's going to be a follow-up schedules adjusting. Um, and that's a perfectly reasonable item to be on that next um, part of the discussion. Yeah. I use that periodically. I think that's very helpful. So it'd be great to get a good version of that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? And then just an update, everybody, we all received from the advisory committee a communication about their um, review of end of the year payouts, um, um, sick leave accruals, concern about um, consistency, whether or not there is consistency across departments, across the town, um, et cetera. And so two things are gonna happen in that regard. Number one, uh, Mr. Purple and the finance team are, are gonna put together you know, just sort of an outline of where things are currently. Um, and then um, we, at some point down the line, I think first individually, then maybe in conjunction with the advisory committee, um, we'll have a discussion about whether or not there are, um, uh, and there are issues um, because we've got union contracts involved as well. Um, and what sort of steps we might think about um, that we might be able to take to make sure, <clears throat> I mean, obviously one of our goals is to make sure that as best we can, that employees in the town are treated as um, equitably and, and uh, fairly as possible, regardless of whether or not their salary administration plan, um, contract A, contract B, um, and just do, it's a pretty reasonable um, uh, observation to do a review of that and make sure that to the extent we can, um, uh, you know, sort of smooth that out and ensure 
um, equity across those various areas that we do it. So that was a long, deep breath to get through all that, um, but that's my report. So I, I just have a question yeah. on that um, because I think some of what was in that letter relates to what's going to happen with the next budget cycle. So um, like where things are budgeted, are they budgeted? And I just want to make sure that we're capturing what should be captured in the budget cycle. So I just want to make sure that we address that piece sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. because no, I absolutely. think it impacts that point. Yeah, no, to the extent it impacts the budget, it'll definitely be part of the discussion. All right, Ms. Braccio. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to update the board that the rent and mortgage program has gone live. It went live on Monday. There were a, a couple glitches. Uh, special thanks to um, Ms. Esposito and, and Mr. Purple and Mr. Laflame for getting that up and going. Um, I just wanted to share um, the value and some of the things that are still happening around town. Um, I was fortunate to be able to partake in a, a drive-through at the senior center that they did for Halloween. Um, thought it was a little strange that all of the, the employees of the um, senior center were dressed as witches, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, I don't think it was characteristic of them in any way, but it was really wonderful and nice to see um, our seniors actually dressing up, you know, coming through the little drive through picking up a little, a little treat and a little gift bag with some candy and stuff in it. And just, just again, having the opportunity while the programs aren't running to be able to have a little bit of, of contact mask to mask, whatever. Um, it, it, it just was, was really wonderful to see. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that those programs to some level are still able to continue to give our seniors um, an opportunity to have something to look forward to you know, and get out of the house. So uh, kudos to, to Pam and crew for that. And lastly, um, we had talked about instituting office hours again. And I know Mr. Laflame and Mr. Purple are working on um, coming up with a process to be able to do that, um, you know, hopefully relatively quickly. I know we've been having a lot of meetings every week, so it, it's kind of tough to, to put the office hours in there. I know we had initially talked about doing it every other Tuesday, but we seem to be meeting on those Tuesdays. So just know that that, that is in the works uh, that Mr. Purple and Mr. LaFlame are, are, are putting steps in place for that to happen. So that's it for me, thank you. Ms. Malinowski. Um, so a few of us had the opportunity to attend the ceremony to honor Sergeant DeLuca and um, all the other officers um, that were involved on the June 22nd event. Um, so it was a nice ceremony um, led by Chief Paulus. Um, there was great representation from both departments. Um, so it was a really, it was really great to see Sergeant DeLuca back um, and see the officers um, honored um, for that event. Great, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Shea. Nothing for me. And Mr. Stivers. Uh, yeah, one quick update, uh, just a quick report. Master Plan Committee is moving along briskly here. Uh, had a couple of good meetings, making good progress. And uh, I think at some point on our radar screen, it would make sense to get an update from them for this board because uh, we're gonna be asked at some point to uh, review, approve, et cetera, what's going on there. So. Uh, not urgent at this point, but uh, ought to keep an eye on that and uh, think about scheduling that uh, hopefully sometime in the next couple of months, potentially. Um, is there a target for, I mean, I've, I've, I've you know, um, literally zoomed in occasionally to watch some of those, uh, some of those meetings. Um, is there, um, is there a target date for when, um, not not the 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 final document, but a but a pretty robust draft is going to be done. Uh, not a firm date, but we've talked about something um, in the early part of 2021. And originally, we'd aimed for a spring town meeting to review with town meeting. Uh, whether that happens or not depends on COVID, I guess. But we're pushing hard to have something early in 2021 for people to react to. We've got a sort of a matrix view of the plan at this point, the skeleton I'd describe it as, that uh, I think has a lot of good information in it and uh, we're working to put some flesh around that. So um, again, our hope is we've got something early in 2021, but uh, a lot of work to do yet. All right, is that all for you? Yep, thank you. 
Mr. Purple, Town Administrator Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of quick items. Um, a couple of things I had on my list that have already been mentioned, so I won't go over those. Uh, the first one, I did send out notice to the board um, uh, late last week um, that uh, Tom LaFlame has uh, um, given his notice um, that he will be leaving us um, for, uh, for another position uh, at the end of the month. His last day with us is November 27th. Um, it's, it's obviously extremely bittersweet. Um, you know, Tom was our first IT manager. Um, you know, we had an outsourcing of, of IT services for uh, 20 years or more. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think it was a great decision to bring it in house. And I think Tom did a great job with it and um, very sad to see him go. Um, you know, um, fortunately for him, he's found, um, you know, uh, a, a job uh, that's similar to what he's doing now. It's just really close to home. And um, there is no way that, um, you know, you can, you can uh, compensate for, for that type of proximity and family. And um, believe me, I thought about it and tried, but, um, but it, it just isn't going to, isn't going to work. So um, I've been having conversations um, with Tom as to things that we need to wrap up in the next several weeks. Um, Tom is going, you know, will be able to, has agreed to make himself available after the 27th um, to some level um, to try and help remotely with things. Um, and I'm having um, uh, the position has been advertised um, to get that out there fairly quickly. Um, but I'm also having other conversations as to um, how we're going to handle that bridge period. And, you know, are there other things that we may want to look at, you know, um, with with Tom leaving as to how, you know, we've structured um, that position. So I will have more information as as um, as we move forward. Um, the only other thing uh, I wanted to note, I think you've seen the updates. Um, we talked about COVID a lot tonight. Um, I, I really, you know, um, value, you know, what Emily's done. Emily and Vanessa and I have a text chain that goes all the way back to March, which basically indicates when every case has come in so we can go back and we can take a look at all this. Um, you know, we currently have 92 positives, um, positive cases um, in town since March. Um, only four of those cases remain in isolation. Uh, 87 of them have been discharged. Um, so um, I think that, you know, we've been, we've been doing a good job in managing those cases and Emily's really been, you know, the conduit to make that happen. Um, and the last item I have is EDC. Uh, if you remember the shared streets grant that EDC was able to get to help to provide some, uh, some tents uh, and some heaters. Um, to, uh, to loan out to businesses to help with some of the outdoor dining um, and extending those periods for them. Um, we now have a liability agreement in place um, that council has signed off on that uh, the businesses will just have to sign, basically releasing us from liability for using our equipment and making sure that uh, what we give them comes back in, um, in the same condition so that it can be loaned out again um, to, uh, to someone else and, and help them. Uh, so that's that's in place, and and I believe that uh, EDC is trying to get those out as quickly as possible. Okay, I think we're all set with reports. <clears throat> On to the consent agenda, and I'm sure all five of these items are going to be held. <laughs> Maybe not. B. Not for me. B. Okay. C. Not for C me. as well. B and C. That's it. Okay, I will move to approve items A, D, and E of um, uh, uh, our consent agenda. Second. Uh, discussion? None? Ms. Braccio? Aye. Ms. Malinowski? Aye. Mr. Shea? Aye. Mr. Stivers? Aye. Mr. Healy is aye. Items A, D, and E are... Um, approved. Uh, item B, Ms. Malinowski. So when I was reviewing um, this, it just had the cover sheet from um, Youth and Family Services Director. So I went to Mr. Purple to find out who the donation was from, to find out if it was anonymous. And I actually didn't see that the amount was on the agenda, um, but it's not listed in the letter. So I think we need to look at a policy for how we handle donations to 
the town, whether it be for a specific department or just to the general fund um, so that we're getting consistent information um, because I wanna make sure that we're aware of who the donation is coming from um, because you know there's rules around who you're allowed to accept donations from. Um, and I do think it makes sense that this board is aware of who. I, I understand if it's somebody that's getting services at Youth and Family that they may choose to remain anonymous. Um, but I think we should have a general practice for that. So I'll be adding that um, policy to my list of policy to do's um, for this board's review. Okay. And just, uh, and just so everyone knows this was made by Pilgrim Church for $500. Okay. Um, any, any discussion about um, what Ms. Malinowski raised? Seems like a good idea. Okay, and item C. So um, I just wanted to take a second and wish um, Robin Richards well um, on her resignation and her new position that she's taken. Um, you know, she was honored today as well at the ceremony. She was the dispatcher that was on when Sergeant DeLuca's incident happened. And she's been a, a tremendous asset to the town. And um, just on behalf of the board, I think we'd like to just wish her, wish her well and, and thank her for the time that she, uh, we were fortunate enough to have her in South Pearl. That's all. All right, well said. All right, I move to approve um, the acceptances listed in B and C of the consent agenda. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Malinowski, who beat Mr. Stivers that time. Uh, Ms. Braccio. Aye. Ms. Malinowski. Aye. Mr. Shea. Aye. Mr. Stivers. Aye. Mr. Healy is aye. We are done with the consent agenda. Going on to 6A, discussion of performance evaluation document policy. <clears throat> you may recall that um, Mr. Norris was going to be on um, our executive session agenda when we kind of got jammed up. Um, one meeting ago or two meetings ago. One of the things I was gonna have him talk about was <clears throat> what was included in the supplement to the packet, which is the, the 2018 Wayland um, decision that that's had a big impact on um, um, the way performance evaluations are treated in, in terms of the public records um, world. And the reason is because <clears throat> And Ms. Malinowski, you were not part of this, but we all did um, um, uh, performance input, um, ratings and the like for Mr. Purple's um, performance evaluation. Those then went to, I don't think they went to the entire personnel board. I think they might've just gone to Mr. Milholland, who longtime member of the personnel board and, and longtime career in um, human resources. Um, he did a, a very nice job um, compiling those and, and basically we have three categories of records right now. And the, the, um, the legal opinion from Mr. Norris that was also included in the packet and the um, decision make it pretty clear that any documents right now, Mr. Milholland did the compilation and he sent them to me. I had some back and forth with, with um, um, some members of the board um, but not everybody, it was just, it was, it was um, um, specific to particular items. Um, and Mr. Milholland was incredibly helpful with that as well. But we've got three categories of documents now. We have a um, composite um, rating for um, Mr. Purple. Um, in other words, it doesn't identify, it's not, it's not identified by um, um, individual rating, but it is a composite for the categories. Um, we have people's individual ratings for those categories. And we have, to greater and lesser extent, um, we have text, prose, comments that relate to those. <clears throat> Anything, right now, I'm the only one other than Mr. Milhallen who's seen them. Um, any items that go to the board um, as part of our um, personnel evaluation review of Mr. Purple automatically become public records. Um, in addition, the, the, the personnel review itself is, is a public, is done in public session, not an executive session. It's the nature of the way things work in Massachusetts. Um, and the reason I wanted to put it on before uh, is, to, is to get guidance from you all. Um, I will tell you, I mean, I've been in the public sector for a long time. It's, it, it is 
it's kind of funny, the folks at the attorney general's office who, who interpret the public records um, um, statute this way, their personnel evaluations are not public records. Um, and uh, none, no, personnel uh, uh, no personnel evaluation I've ever gotten in my various, mostly federal, but, but some state as well is a, is a public record. It's, um, that's, that is different in Massachusetts. So my question is very simply, um, and I, I'm kind of agnostic on this. Um, what what of those documents do um, do we want to include as part of the packet that goes out? Because um, um, anything that goes out to the entire board automatically becomes a public record. So that's the reason I put it on the agenda for today and to hear people's thoughts. And you know what? I'm going to start with Mr. Shea. Put you on the spot. <laughs> Much more comfortable with engineering documents and reports than personal <laughs> matters like this. Um, don't, yeah, again, not. I guess I'm at the disadvantage of not knowing what you know, right? I don't know what's what's there. Um, well, again, I, I, again, and maybe there there are there is a composite. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a grid, um, and it is a composite rating for particular for the particular categories that relate to um, uh, 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 Mark's job responsibilities and. Yeah. And there's a composite performance for that. Yeah. that. That is created from individual ratings that each of the then five members of the board of selectmen. But so, so the composite is one record. Yep. The individual um, evaluations with numbers is a second record. And then for each of those, and some people took no advantage. Some people took um, sporadic advantage. Some people took extensive advantage to have, as I said, pros which um, um, uh, is um, puts puts meat on the bone of the uh, of the, the the number that's included in the um, composite. Yeah. Um, I, I and the other possibility, actually, I, one thing I forgot. The other thing, the other reason I'm bringing this up is because I I know when I filled out these items, um, less so the composite, less so the ratings, but um, when I did the pros. I did not do so with the understanding that what I was writing was going to become a public record. Um, I did it with the intent that it was going to become a performance evaluation that would go to the individual who was being evaluated. Um, and so the other possibility is that people looked at the individual um, uh, uh, comments that they wrote and make a determination about whether or not they want them included as part of the performance evaluation. That's another possibility. Yep. So again, we got tension here on the one hand, yep. you know, Performance evaluations in, in, in most of the world are, are um, uh, 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 private um, communications between managers, supervisors, and the people they manage and supervise with the, with the design towards, towards um, rewarding, improving, enhance, whatever their performance. It's, we're, in a, we're in a public sector world here, and particularly with the public records law in Massachusetts, um, and so there is the additional function of these. Presumably, they also do, are designed to do those things, um, but they also become part of the, the the public record as opposed to simply going in somebody's personnel file. Yep. So, so I guess a, so. This not an easy process, issue from my perspective. Yeah. So this process shouldn't stop us from doing a performance evaluation. I think that that needs to continue. Oh, absolutely. And so, and that process needs to be in at an open meeting, as I understand from what you said previously. Correct. And we have a situation as well where there's, you know, Ms. Malinowski, I think this all happened before she joined the board. So there may be uh, data presented from Mr. Kalenda, who is no longer on the board as well. And Mr. Kalenda would not have the opportunity to participate in the in the performance review. I guess I would lean towards including the composite information in the packet. 
And certainly if, you know, if individuals have comments that, it, that they want to make that are, you know, reflective of what they had written uh, and the information that Mr. Milholland had, had compiled, that gives them the opportunity to state it. If they uh, made those comments not recognizing that it would be a public record, it gives them perhaps the opportunity not to make the comment in a, in a public setting, but to have a, um, you know, a, a private conversation with, with, Mr., with Mr. Purple. Um, so I guess that's the way I would come down. I, I, I think we need to move forward with the performance evaluation. And I guess I would include the composite and you know, give board members the flexibility to, to make whatever comments they wanted to during the performance evaluation process. Mr. Stivers. Thanks. Uh, I also, I guess, am somewhat agnostic about this, although I guess I can argue that given that, uh, again, not just focused on Mr. Purple, but uh, you know, any evaluations we might do, and I think there are some others that we need to be involved in, um, that uh, if this is public money paying public employees, I think there's an argument that the public has a right to know in terms of what the uh, the employers, if you will, uh, think in terms of performance here. On the other hand, I understand that there's sensitivity around that. Uh, uh, the comments that I wrote in this particular instance were ones that I am comfortable with being public. On the other hand, I understand that has some uh, implications with it as well. So I think that the, uh, the overall grid and even the individual uh, rankings, the sort of numerical part of it, uh, I'm comfortable with having as a public document. I think that um, you know the the more detailed text or, or description uh, would be fine in a, in a public uh, performance appraisal that the commenters could choose to amplify or not. Um, I've actually been looking around. Uh, YouTube has a number of interesting uh, videos for other boards of selectmen doing performance appraisals of town administrators and others. And uh, one model seems to be to actually have an opportunity for individual board members to have conversations with the person being reviewed as a private conversation to provide that kind of feedback uh, that I think is appropriate. I think if, if at least if I were being reviewed, I'd want to have you know, detailed examples of whatever suggestions for things that I might think about doing to improve performance that may or may not be appropriate for a public setting. So I think that's important to have a, a avenue for direct feedback like that uh, outside of the public discussion potentially. So again, I'd vote for putting the numbers out there and then having a, a public uh, discussion where people could bring up uh, whatever detail they felt was appropriate. Ms. Braccio. Thank you. Just, just um, one question, Marty. I don't know if, if you had spoken to Tim Norris about this. I know labor laws have some level of, of uh, protection for you know employees, and we'll understand that the town administrator is a contracted employee. Um, did you have any discussion about what technically can be released and can't? I mean, I don't know. I don't know the laws. So I don't know if like on a, on a regular SAP employee, if somebody just wanted to do a public records request and get their review, I don't know, would they just get the cover sheet or would they get the actual review? And I think it, we need to follow some form of standard here. And I know when personnel board, for instance, reviews something, they don't necessarily make the whole document public. Um, it's only the cover sheet. So, I mean, I, I, I agree that the, the, the ratings uh, obviously should be out there. Um, and, and as far as the comments go, I mean, if, if uh, I wrote them, so I'm, I'm comfortable having those discussions on those. Um, but again, I just, I want to make sure that we're, we're not potentially getting in any trouble with what is protected under labor law. Yeah, believe me, I, 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 the reason, the reason I went back and forth with Mr. Norris, and you know, uh, the reason I dove into the to the uh, the Whalen decision and and the like is, is, uh, what you've just described is is to me a real issue, um, that that, um, um, and 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 I am happy to put that. I did not put that question because honestly, the. Um, 
the, the, the opinion of the Supreme Judicial Court is pretty clear. And that is that if something goes to the entire board as part of its consideration, that it becomes a public record. Um, there, boy, there's not a lot of equivocation or wiggle room in that SJC opinion. Um, I'm happy to follow up with him. Um, and you know what, Ms. Malinowski, I'm, well, I'm responding to Ms. Braccio. I, I'm, I'm not leaving you out, even though you weren't part of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the review process. I'm happy to reach out to him and get clarification on that. Um, and maybe even again, right now, other than um, Russ, I'm the only one who's seen these. Um, uh, obviously, I, sharing them with Mr. Norris um, and getting his opinion on whether or not any of the any of the items are problematic. I suspect the answer is going to be no, but it's probably not a bad idea to to run them by him and get that and and and, and get that green light. Okay. And again, you know, I'm I'm fine with with leaving the comments out and and leaving it to the individual members when we have the discussion. If if there's something in particular that that I want to share publicly in there, you know, uh, we certainly have the opportunity to do so. Okay, Ms. Malinowski. So I don't necessarily have an opinion on which of the three tiers um, because I didn't participate in um, this review, but I am curious how you would handle uh, Mr. Kalenda's input, seeing as he's no longer on the board. Um, and I also think that going forward, when we do a review, that we complete the process before we turn over board members. So that way, I mean, I think we owe it to Mr. Purple to give him the evaluation and the feedback in a more timely manner. Um, I also think we need to keep in mind that he's coming up on his next contract. And so I would appreciate having the opportunity to do an evaluation before we're asked to um, enter contract negotiations with him. I think, I think getting feedback as a town administrator is extremely important. And um, I was on a webinar through M MMA last week, and they actually talked about doing six month reviews for your town administrator. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Just make sure your board members are on the same page with your town administrator, you're going in the right direction. Um, so I would actually like to see a more robust review process um, going forward. Okay. All right. What I will do is um, send a packet of materials to um, Mr. Norris and see if there are any issues that, that again, it's one of the reasons I wanted to come in um, a couple of weeks ago to, to talk about, among other things, this very subject. Um, and, uh, and Chelsea, I, don't, I, I agree with you. I mean, th this, is, this is yet another item that is, that is in large part a victim of COVID-19. Um, I mean, a lot of this was completed in, in, in February and March and went into a black hole um, just because of, of um, other things that were being addressed. Um, so um, anything else? In, uh, I don't think there's any need for a vote tonight. Let me get these items to Mr. Norris, get feedback from him, and um, to be continued probably on the 17th. Fair enough? Okay. All right. Um, round two of public comment. And where's my participant? We've discouraged everybody but two. Yeah, I don't see any hands. Going once, going twice. All right. I think we are done with the public portion of our meeting. And uh, Mr. Purple, we can um, we can move into executive session um, with the understanding that we are not coming back to open session. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, so I move that the board enter into executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter Thirty A, Section Twenty One, not returning to open session to discuss. Um, and I'm going to, to discuss strategy, um, attorney-client communications. Um, um, with respect to um, litigation, specifically um, John and Marjorie Warfield, the town of Southborough. Um, and I, as such, I'm declaring that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating and litigating position of the public body. So that's my motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Stiver's discussion. Ms. Braccio. Aye. 
Ms. Malinowski. Aye. Mr. Shea. Aye. Mr. Stivers. Aye. And Mr. Healy is aye. So we are adjourned for the public portion of our meeting, going into executive session, not to return to open session. Good night, everybody. So we just need a minute, Marty, to um, stop the